And we are back to discuss some of the biggest powerhouse series the past couple of months, Rings of Power and House of the Dragon. And of course, I'm here once again with Preston and special guest Yoiston from YouTube channel Men of the West. What's up, Yoiston? It's been a minute. Yeah, man, it has been. It's uh, it's going good. Well, better now that Rings of Power is over. So <laughs> thank you so much for having me back. <laughs> but but, uh, but you guys, you guys are big it. experts. Men, Men of the West, you guys are big experts mm-hmm. on She-Hulk, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's our that's our main content, of course. <laughs> of course, for those of you who don't know, Yoisin here does Lord of the Rings content, and you were one of the first really big Lord of the Rings channels um, to do this, the, the the series on YouTube. Actually, I remember when I met you, like what was that seven years ago at, at this point? Now, yeah, yeah and seven or eight. You asked right before you started your channel. You asked me if I had any advice for you, and I said, "Don't suck." And uh, here you yep. are, many years <laughs> later, not sucking. Good stuff, man. Good thanks, stuff. thanks. I try not to. I try not to. For you, sure. Keep to Yoisin, that Yoisin, with the title, with the title, Men of the West. Do you, do you have other people that you work with uh, for the channel, or is the men in plural you? You know, you would, yeah, you would think I would have thought about this more for sure. Uh, <laughs> it's funny, like my my friend Royan, childhood friend that I do a lot of like all the Rings of Power reviews with, and uh, we do a monthly podcast on Patreon. I guess it's just really the two of us. But how I think about it is, Men of the West is like the whole community. Uh, you know, army uh-huh. of like three hundred and seventy thousand or whatever it is. But uh, that's more how I think about it for sure. T- Tolkien, Tolkien Nation. Yeah, Tolkien Nation. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, let's 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 start this whole thing with uh, Rings of Power. And uh, me and Preston, we're very <clears throat> excuse me. Me and Preston, we're very lukewarm on it. Middle of the road. Mm. Uh, I, however, I did listen to every single one of you and Royan's uh, reviews for Rings of Power because unlike some of the other. People covering Rings of Power, you guys aren't grifters, you guys aren't complaining about random things that don't really matter, like black elves and dwarves, like that's not, who cares? You guys are mostly concerned with things like, you know, uh, the fact that Durin, (laughs) you complain about this all the time, that Durin essentially talked smack to Gilgalad and lied to his face. So, so why, why does Ring of Power, because I... I think it's just middle of the road, okay. But why do you think it's it's straight out garbage? Well, for me, it's like I mean, there are so many layers to the whole show, right? To to kind of get this out of the way first, it's like you know, Amazon they they did reach out to me back in like early summer. They invited me to a London event to see behind the scenes. Whoa, whoa, whoa! You got invited by? I didn't know this. I actually, wow. I didn't know what whoa. I did. And I, re- I rejected it. What? And yeah, the, the, so those super those super fan panels that they had that everyone was complaining <laughs> about. You could have been on one. I could have been on a later one. So that super fans panel, that first one, that was uh, for the Super Bowl, uh, the Super Bowl commercial uh, back in February. But then they didn't do wow. it in the same way. But they invited a bunch of Tolkien influencers or whatever you want to call it, really podcasters, YouTubers, TikTokers, all this kind of stuff. Uh, you know, prof- uh, Tolkien professor was there, Nerd of the Rings, my good friend Matt, uh, they were all there. And um, obviously, you know, no disrespect, no shade to those guys who went, and uh, it seems like they had a great time, and I'm happy for them, but for me, it just didn't feel the right choice. I'm anonymous, and I wanted to kind of stay, you know, very third party when it came to the show, didn't want it to seem like I was swayed one way or the other. I definitely appreciate the invite, but no, you know, they invited me Mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. to the premiere in New York, also said no. And... I'm sure it was a cool experience and, you know, being able to talk to the showrunners or see behind the scenes, whatever it was. But for me, I could come at it from purely a Tolkien, um, someone who, who's read the books and watched the movies and, and loves the universe without having had those experiences. And for me, the show started off okay, but then it started to tank when they took themes of Tolkien's lore and caricaturized them, right? Like, you know, Tolkien, obviously, it's a big thing and, and kind of a meme at this point, how much he loves or loved trees, right? But the show mm, yeah. took that element and characterized it. There wasn't enough meaning behind the trees as they used them. It felt like they just threw in cheap Tolkienian references. And as the show went on, I realized that more and more. They would throw in these amazing, cool set pieces or references. Uh, a tapestry of Baron and Luthien from the Silmarillion. Um, you've got perhaps the the... 
the dragon helm of Dor Loman, of Turin Tarambar and the Silmarillion and Narsil and all of this kind of stuff in the backgrounds of some of these scenes. And I'm like, oh, that's great. But that reflects nothing within the story. Like, cool. That's not enough to yeah. save you, though. And so it felt like they characterized a lot of these themes and a lot of all of this. It felt like a 2022 uh, Lord of the Rings show that they tried to mask in Middle Earth. But it just felt like a 2022, an average 2022 fantasy show that they just tried to merge into Tolkien, you know? So I really so I, so didn't I, like the, the series overall. I, I have the, I have this little uh, analogy to, to House of the Dragon, and and it's something that I'm I'm seeing in a lot of shows these days. It's actually quite curious. Is so in House of the Dragon, they have Rhaenyra's table on yeah. Dragonstone, and it's, and yeah. it's this beautiful table that that artists must have spent God knows how many hours <laughs> creating. Yeah. It's it's right. And if you look at the table, it's just so fucking wrong. It's so fucking wrong in every respect. Like everything marked on that table is just fucking wrong. Okay. It's just like the whole cut. It's so stupid. Like it's like if you actually like look at it and be like, wait a minute, this is Aegon's table. Like why is King's Landing on it? Why is there a King's Road? Why is High Heart on the fucking table? Like (laughs) High Heart, like. Like it doesn't make any sense. Like, yeah. like High Heart is a, is a hill that was only on there because Arya went there. Like it, oh, it wouldn't be on a freaking war table that Aegon the Conqueror was using to, yeah. to invade Westeros. Like like and but so you kind of step back and you go, wow, there's such a degree of like incredible work and also mm-hmm. incredible laziness, like yes. bound together in one thing. And you're like, how? Because it's so odd. Because I don't have anything in my own life. That's yeah. both <laughs> dedicated and lazy simultaneously, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. like I either work really hard on something or I'm really lazy on something. But it's very rare that, that you know, right, like you buy a Maserati and then yeah. choose to, like, not get its oil, oil changed, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, these two things kind of don't go together. My um, head canon for that is that the, the people who they they added these small little things to the table later on they added oh like they they sanded it down well at the, unfortunately Summerhall is on the fucking table so like you can't really explain that one away you know like time traveling brand on I'm, that one yeah. I'm trying to yeah, make sense of it time traveling I'm, I'm brand trying brand. it's so dumb I'm trying to make sense of it but in terms of Rings of Power I'm so glad I know you because. And I'm so glad that I have uh, – we have Amber as well who does Wheel of Time content. She's a Wheel of Time YouTuber. Mm-hmm. I can hit her up whenever that comes back because I was hitting you up yeah. almost every week. I'm like, hey, is that a thing? What does this mean? Can you explain yeah. this? So thank you for that. But uh, For sure, what, one, of, one of the things we discussed privately was Galadriel and how her character yeah. – it's like they wanted to make her Arya, but she's she's yes. not Arya. The, 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 the one thing I always say is – it's like they're giving her Luke's original trilogy character arc, but at that point she's really just Obi Wan because she's so much older and she should be more mature yeah. and more, mm. you know, yeah, yeah. Well, and that that's something that Roy and I talked quite a bit about. It's like you cannot simultaneously have this character that you say is very old, very wise, has been around since before the sun and moon, but then also have her be committing the mistakes that like a fourteen year old in a teen drama novel would be would be doing i mean uh, unless unless you're unless you're a vampire in a uh in a in a, in a uh upn show I, i'm saying they do it with the vampires all the time like they yeah. make the vampires like that is act true. like high school students that's um, true and and i feel like with that it might be like oh well maybe they they slept for a long time or they didn't have the social interactions that like these elves should have had over time to make them really smart but you've got Galadriel who is the granddaughter of the first high king of all the Noldor her hair caught the light of the two trees of Valinor and were some of them was like mm. the most beautiful hair in all of the world but then this same woman does not have any political sense at all and like threatens to stab anyone who just makes her mildly upset in the show in, of season one it's like you cannot I mean, simultaneously yeah you're right that watching the show she felt like any other elf, right? Like not one of the oldest elves ever of a royal family that like, yeah. she just felt like any other elf. Like, oh, I'm just watching this show about this one interesting elf who had this yeah. older brother and she lost her older brother and we're watching her and she's she's fighting against the system because like they're not listening to her. And th- that's that's the story yeah. that was put in front of us. But Which yeah, is the background a... that... 
yeah, I mean, that's such a 2022 story. I mean, her older brother, for instance, Finrod Felagund, is my favorite elf in the entire mm. Legendarium. But you would not know mm. why from the show. Like, she, he, he is my favorite of all the elves. And it's because he's everybody's friend. He goes and he's the first elf to ever encounter men in the Legendarium as we have it. He's He befriends men immediately. He is friends with the dwarves. Oh, so he's your favorite character? Fa- f- my favorite elf. Favorite elf. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I thought Gladriel's husband, Kelborn, was your favorite. And I don't know if you know this, but he died in the show. <laughs> oh, oh, we'll get there. We'll get there. But <laughs> with Finrod, this is one of, like, this is a, <laughs> an instance of where the show uh, really screwed up the themes. And that was my big, that was what I always said, even the first time that I talked to you guys. It was like, the, as long as they get the themes right, the show should at least be okay. But Finrod hmm. was apparently on this quest of vengeance against Sauron that Galadriel took up, at least according to Galadriel. She took up this quest to go yeah. after Sauron. Yeah, Finrod was not like that. In the in the book, Finrod only died because he was defending his friend, a man whose father he made an oath to, uh, to help. He was defending him yeah. from one of Sauron's werewolves. And he he gave up his immortal elven, high, you know, ma- majestic life to save this dirty, gross man, you know? Because he swore an now, oath. Yeah. yeah. Now, I get it. Like, I, 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 I understand, like, divorcing the story from Lord of the Rings lore. Like, I yeah. understand, like, what they're doing with Galadriel. Like, Galadriel, she's yeah. paralleled with Nori. And yeah. Nori and Galadriel both show kindness to a stranger and, and, and are both kind of uh, portrayed as outsiders or renegades or rebels within their own society. But, you know, they, they're yeah. going to do what they need to do. And then Galadriel's kindness, um, she's double crossed while Nori's kindness like bears fruit, right? Yeah. Like I understand like why these stories were portrayed that way. However, is it, is it a good idea from the beginning to have Galadriel paralleled to a random Hobbit girl? <laughs> you know, like that's, true. I, you know, I don't, you know, so I don't know. Um, like I, I get it in a, in a narrative sense, like looking at those two stories as parallel, but uh, it, yeah, they might've not been the best choices from the start. That's interesting. I never even really thought much about that parallel, but you're, you're absolutely right. And, and the, the problem is that, a lot of the conflict in the show, a lot of these parallels are so manufactured. You know, they're they're very manufactured, right? We have all of this weird contention, right? The the elves that are fearing death because of withering away, which I thought was by far the weakest plot in the entire show. <laughs> <laughs> this darkness yeah. and death that all of a sudden came to their trees and everything, which we thought was connected to the Meteor Man or Gandalf. And then Halbrand, this guy in the middle of the ocean... I don't know how he got there or why happens to be Sauron picks up Galadriel. They go to Numenor and it's just, it's the plot is very much. We do whatever we need the characters to do at whatever time we need the right. characters to do, regardless of like actual real life things or how people would really. Why, act. why is, why is Harbrand like having fist fights in the street? Yeah. If he's actually fucking Sauron, like, should yeah, yeah. he be like, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Well, let me ask Why? you this. Would it be better if the main character wasn't Galadriel? Yes. It was just some random elf woman? That's it, what I was it thinking, It doesn't too. even have to be a random elf woman. It could be Galadriel's daughter, Celebrian, because Celebrian is powerful, and she is younger. She was born in the Second Age, if I recall. Um, mm, yeah. And literally wouldn't have been that hard of a transition. But the only thing, and this is what annoys me as well, is that the name recognition. It's just not there. Yeah. They want Galadriel to be the protagonist. They want Elrond to be Absolutely. one of the main... And so it's like, that's not going to make as much money, this Calabrian, even if it makes far more sense within the lore itself that they're adapting. It, Wait a minute. Involved. Doesn't Elrond actually end up marrying Galadriel's daughter? Yes. Yeah, th- then why didn't they just do that? Then you could have had the plot with Elrond and then her and then continue. Because <laughs> my favorite part of the of the, of the the series was the friendship between Durin and Elrond. I thought that was great. I love that so much. They're... Like yeah, that was that was so great. Now, By the way, we need to go back and rewatch the series, imagining Galadriel as Galadriel's daughter, and see yeah. if like we're not as yeah. angry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it would be so much better because then it would be like Celeborn and Galadriel, like her parents would be there. We wouldn't have this mysterious disappearance of Celeborn or this this quote unquote death of Celeborn, and 
you could have that romance start to bloom between her and Elrond. I mean, isn't that weird, right? We can imagine, unless they hid it from us, like they hid Celeborn until like episode six or seven or whatever it was, uh, hmm. maybe they have hidden Celebrian from us as an audience, but I don't get, when I watched the show, I didn't get the feeling that Celebrian had been born yet. So you have Elrond and Galadriel, who are old friends. Gal- Elrond will go on to marry Galadriel's daughter, who has not even been born yet. It's just so screwed up. It's just so weird. And it's just mm-hmm. a simple writing issue, you know? By the way, uh, Preston mentions the stranger earlier uh, with Nori. I don't think that's Gandalf. I think that's the being that will eventually split into the five wizards. Um, I'm hoping. I haven't heard that theory. Interesting. Because I, I, I don't want it to be Gandalf. Obviously, Gandalf only comes in th- uh, during the third age, right? Yeah, well, so it's I'm like 90% sure it's Gandalf and I'll make the show even worse for you. So, a lot of the show's pro- <laughs> a lot of the show's problems too is that they quoted ahead of time. If they quoted from the book, it was from the late third age and they're in like the mm. beginning, middle, end second age, whatever they are cuz we don't even know when they are. Um, but sometimes they would actually quote from the movies. I'm pretty sure this is Gandalf because in the last episode, he says Always follow your nose, which is what Gandalf exact like the exact line that Gandalf says in Fellowship uh, of the Ring. And it was like <clears throat> cheeky. It was like they did it in a cheeky way, where it's right. like, ah, oh, it's Gandalf. Like he, yeah. He looked at the camera and was like, yeah. <laughs> give a wink. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was just like when Halbrand was like, consider it a gift. And I'm like, okay, so you're Anatar, the Lord of Gifts, aka Sauron. Right from wh- how he delivered that line, I was like, okay, I know who you are now. They they like, really should have no, like no. leaned into who because the well, the best mystery of the show was who is Sauron who, who I don't I, I'm like fuck the stranger who cares who where's Sauron who is Sauron they had to have known that people were going to be looking out for this and I wish they kind of made it more I don't know mysterious because I think by the third or fourth episode I think everybody understood that Halbrand was Sauron I think everybody got that like it was it was, yeah. it was very yeah. very apparent. It, it was, and it was so apparent. Like, I talked about this in, in the season review that I did. It's like, it was so apparent that I actually thought, oh, there's no way. There's no way that the Stranger's Gandalf. There's no way that Halbrand's Sauron, because it's, like, too easy. It's too hmm. on the nose. But as time went on and everything, especially that last episode where they just dropped, like, re- reveal after reveal, I was like, oh, okay. So it was, the easiest plot was the truest plot, for sure. The Mithril I, I think I would have been, uh, yeah... I think I would have been fooled more if Halbrand weren't such a dickhead. <laughs> yeah. Like in, in many ways, in many ways, I'm like, I'm like, why is Galadriel even like hanging out with this dude? He's a dick. Like, and then, and then he turns out to be Sauron. Had they actually made him more of like, like you know, you get those elements that they're trying to Aragorn him a little bit, yeah. you know. Yeah. For um, sure. But had they Aragorn him, if had they made him more Aragorn from the like the beginning, maybe it would have been you know something that fooled people. But. uh yeah, instead you're just like, man, like right from the beginning you're like, ah, oh, this guy is uh this guy's a jerk. He's just killing people in the streets and Yeah. Try, <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's trying awful. To st- try to Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, and it's and it's weird because Sauron in the in the book, and, and that's what we have to remember too, is this is yeah. This says the Lord of the Rings. It's not any of the books by any stretch of the imagination, because in the book everything was different. I, I in the early reviews I started to say you know, what are the big differences and, and how did the show change them? But it got to a point where I stopped doing that because everything was pretty much a change. Sauron in the book was so, um, and when I say book, I really mean Unfinished Tales and Silmarillion. Um, he was so yeah. methodical about approaching the elves when he did. He took hundreds of years to to kind of corrupt them in ways that they didn't understand and to teach them this ring craft that he must have learned from Aule the Smith or, or like, the elements of which he learned from one of the Valar and, and he made it his own. And then he corrupted the elves over hundreds of years. And then that failed. Instead, instead of, instead of just being like, Hey, have you guys ever heard of an alloy? Yeah. An alloy. What? Yeah, exactly. It's, he just, got, and it's almost like he didn't even plan to go to Aregian. He just got like stabbed or whatever. And then Galadriel was like, oh, let's bring you there. And then, it was, again, the plot makes people go where the plot wants them to go. Uh, yeah. When he went to Numenor, in the book, again, it was pretty... Con- I, I think he conceived it over over hundreds of years to do this plan because he called himself 
the the god of men and like the king of the earth and all of this stuff. And then all the men in Numenor, they're just like, they said, yeah, no, screw that guy. They built an armada and came over and just immediately got him to surrender. They brought him back. He took decades to rise from prisoner to advisor. And then the downfall of Numenor occurred. He kind of just pushed them over the edge that they were standing near anyway. But in the show, yeah. it's like, I don't know if him coming to Numenor, if he'll come back to Numenor again, because he's technically already been there. So, so, um, yeah, because, because like we, you know, in, in, in the community, like we, we, we watch a lot of videos and we got, we get a lot of like fan takes. Like, I feel like it's very hard for me to even, uh, digest, um, uh, shows like objectively anymore because I'm being influenced by stuff. So for instance, yeah. like Galadriel, like it's hard to watch Galadriel because, like, I know there's so many videos out there bashing her that are like straight up sexist. Yeah, and so for like, sure. and so that so then when I'm watching it, I'm like, am I influenced by that? And I want to give her more of a tr- do I want to give her more of a chance than than normally, you know? And 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 I'm like, and I feel the bias of everything coming in, like like other people's biases, my bias, like the, yeah. the fighting. So in order to escape this, I just like my mom watched uh, rings of power. And yeah. so, so I just like asked my mom, like her hot takes, like, what did you think of the show? Yeah. And she's just like, and it's funny. Cause you know, she's this, she's, you know, she's an old lady and she's like, ah, uh, Galadriel, like, She's just not very likable. And I was like, okay. Like, <laughs> yeah, um, there it is. And I was like, okay, okay. And and she's like, she's like, but I like that black elf. You know? <laughs> like, yeah. Like, Aron- Arondir was actually my favorite character in the show, I would say. Arondir uh, is your favorite uh, character. Because I thought... Arondir. I, I thought Adar, Benjen, Uncle Benjen, um, I thought he was probably the best character in the whole show. He was... It was interesting the take that they tried to do with him because theoretically an elf like this could exist where it's like he was halfway through the corruption into an orc. Perhaps he escaped it somehow. Mm. But they really humanized the orcs in a very weird way. Uh, Tolkien grappled with the philosophy of orcs and and his morality as like a Catholic and could orcs be saved? Could they be redeemed? Or would they? In my opinion, I think this is what Tolkien seemingly landed on is that Orcs were the soulless husks of, like, elves. They were almost... I mean, elves could choose to uh, leave their bodies if their bodies were tormented enough. Their Fear uh, spirits could separate from their whore, or bodies, and they could just go go to Valinor. And I feel like that's what happened, so that these orcs don't really have free will. They're not true beings. But what they did with the Adar plot was all of a sudden we're starting to feel more badly for these orcs. He, he, he treats them like his you know, children, as Adar means father mm. in Elvish. And it's, and it's problematic because we think back to the other stories. We even think back to the, the Lord of the Rings movies. And, you know, there's Aragorn cutting heads off of orcs left and right. And it's like, yeah. well, did every orc have a story? Did they have a personality? It's like the, the show is making us start to ask questions of the lore that I don't think Tolkien intended to based on how he wrote things. No, Arondir was was my favorite because he actually had the themes of courage and bravery and um, the elven kinship with, with the race of men. How he approached men uh, was very compassionate and loving and uh, this, this sense of protection that I got from, like, this is how elves and Tolkien's works, in my opinion, are, are generally meant to be. Concerning Galadriel, mm. I, I, I can point to, like, two or three major instances where I'm like, they really screwed up this character End of episode one, she jumps off the boat and tries to swim across an entire <laughs> ocean. And that's like, it's like swimming from Hawaii to California. It's like, okay, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> good luck. <laughs> so she tried to kind of kill herself there in some regard. She gets to Numenor and then um, she talks to Tar Muriel with less uh, aptitude, with less political insight than Ned Stark did with like Joffrey. At, in season mm. one, like Ned Stark, I mean, yeah, I don't know. Ned Stark was like a political uh, professor compared to Galadriel in the show, <laughs> and it's it's crazy. Wait, because Preston, does, does Galadriel Ned have even any scenes even in the book with Joffrey? I don't think he does. Besides the uh, with arrest, the, uh, the throne. He, he doesn't. Sp- he doesn't. He doesn't speak any words. But like he, um, like Joffrey as king. No, just just the arrest. I don't think he he. I mean, obviously Joffrey's there during the di- like during the Dairy Direwolf incident and mm-hmm. things like that. Yeah. And, 
you know, the great feast. But I don't know if they ever trade any lines with each other. I, I guess more what I'm thinking of is that, yeah, yeah. that arrest throne room scene. Because we have hmm. a, a very similar scene with Galadriel and Tarmiriel in Tarmiriel's, like, throne room. And then Galadriel's just like, oh, screw all of you. And, oh, I'm an elf. And did you guys forget who gave you this island? Which is also not really the yeah, case. Yeah. But she talks to her with such, I'm like, how did you not get beheaded? Like, if this were Game of Thrones, your head would be on a spike right now, Galadriel. And it's Considering moments that like they're that. Suppo- they're supposed to be hating. They're supposed to be hating elves. Exactly. Right? She's not they're... supposed to be there. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You have all of these just in- wild inconsistencies. They let her out of prison, like these five Numenorean or four Numenorean guards, and then Arpharazon. Uh, they let her out of the her cell, and she immediately throws four of the guards into her own cell. She's strangely like o- physically overpowered. She's like just this insane warrior and one of the greatest of all times. But then when it comes to actually social interactions, she is dumb as a rock. <laughs> and it's like, they could have, hmm. m- they could have ma- made the two meet a little bit more in the middle. May- make her like, maybe not as good of a warrior, but then make her actually a real person, you know? Yeah. Uh, her characterization was absolutely horrendous. Pro- problem solved. If she's Galadriel's daughter. Uh, exactly. But, That's what I'm saying. But let, let, let's let's let, let's be positive for for a moment and say that uh, and talk about. So my favorite story was the the um, the coming of the dark the dark elf and mm-hmm. um, you know the, the 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 sexual tension between the the milf and and the elf and <laughs> and her her actually rise or like I think her characterization of the milf like becoming the leader of the village was a was a was actually a pretty well done journey um and i thought the battle scenes were pretty good you know the i i i didn't like her son i thought her son was not very likable but Mm. um overall i really liked that front of the story it was a compelling villain Mm -hmm. it was some interesting protagonists with some like real emotion um you know there were some twists and turns like i i uh you know, like I was fooled by them winning the battle and then not winning the battle, and then them yeah. or them them finding the the sword and not finding the sword. I did think that was a little weird that Galadriel just shows up all of a sudden to like help him win that battle. That was weird because <laughs> yeah. considering that like you're crossing thousands and thousands of miles, but oh yeah, um, the, well that, that that's but, oh sorry, go ahead. No, no, that, but other than that, other than them showing up like all at once, I re- like I was waiting and hoping to get back to that plot. Like I really yeah. liked, um, uh, what, what, Ar- what is it, Ar- 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 Arandir? I'm, I'm forgetting these these elf names. Oh, uh, yeah. Arandir, Arandir, yep. Arandir, Arandir. I liked, I loved Arandir's capture and escape from the 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 prison camp. Yeah, you know, I um. I, I loved his battles where he like takes down that tower and like, yeah. I, mean, I, I, I thought there was some really interesting um, characterization, really interesting journeys with the characters um, and, and a, a great villain like that, like had the whole story been that yeah. I would have been pretty happy. Yeah. No, that, <laughs> and know? that's totally fair. I mean, I think there, there was, it started off a little slow, that plot line, but it really got hmm. some momentum going and, uh, yeah, I one thing I didn't quite understand was why they didn't abandon Tirharad or, or Mordor when it was like, you guys are clearly overrun by orcs, right? Try to maybe leave, find allies, come back, reclaim your homeland, that sort of thing. But they stayed yeah, there. Yeah, I think they were trying to pull the, they were trying to pull the, this is our home kind of thing. Yeah. You know. The... <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, even with like the Hobbit though, right? The dwarves who survived the, the coming of Smaug, they were like, yeah, we can't stand today. We got to, we got to come back. Uh, <laughs> and and that's one of my bigger problems with the series just in a writing point of view is the context we don't know they show us maps but we don't really know where people are and how long it takes to travel places because there weren't mm. when you watch the Lord of the Rings movies you get the sense that they're going on this long journey you see walking shots and huge establishing shots and everything like that right with these guys takes place over like a year you know like it takes a year to get someplace yeah this show was simultaneously at the beginning of of the second age because you have sauron missing and it was at the middle of the second age because you have the forging of the rings and it was at the end of the second age because you have you have the corruption of numenor simultaneous i didn't actually i wondered partway through if they were actually going to do the 
the uh, Witcher treatment with Netflix season one of like, oh, maybe this is at three different points in time. Maybe, maybe they're oh, going times, to... yeah. Yeah, but no, because the Meteor Man in episode one, it was like he came through every plot line and everyone saw him. And I'm like, okay, so this mm. is all at the same point in time. So Galadriel coming from Numenor to, to Middle Earth, that I think should have taken a couple months, I, I would imagine, with a host. It wasn't that big of an army, but from what I remember with the Unfinished Tales, like uh, Alderion the Mariner, he was gone for months or years at a time. I imagine she was probably traveling, she had to have been traveling for months, but that could not have feasibly been the case because it did not at all feel like months. It was like the Southlands are under attack, let's go help them, and it was maybe a couple days is what, yeah. yeah. So the inconsistency of context was just astonishing with, with this show. I couldn't ground it in anything. I, I didn't know yeah. how old Elrond really was. I didn't know what he had been through. No idea. Right, and and so that that the that was my like my, my favorite plot. The with regards to the the Hobbit plot and you know the Elrond Dwarven plot, like those characters, I loved the characters in both of those fronts. I just wish they were doing something. Like yeah. they were all, I think they were, had some really strong characterization, strong makeup, strong, strong sets and environment. Yeah. You know, I just, but when you actually say like, well, what did, what did Nori do, uh, you know, for eight, for eight episodes? I'd be <laughs> yeah. like, well, she found this, me- she found this meteor man. Uh-huh. <sighs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. And then, and, and then she's teaching him how to love and how to care and how to be a person, Preston. Come on. <laughs> hardly. She hardly does that. Yeah, the and cultists then, like, okay, did El- that more, right? They gave right. him more back so, in like, memory. <laughs> right. And you're like, okay, Elrond and Durin. Like, okay, so what was their plot? Well, um, Elrond, he needs this, he needs this, uh, this ore. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Preston, he needs the ore so they can save the elven people from the the thing. Right. Oh, I'm, I'm okay. actually blanking I, on I it. I get it. That's the setting. But then, like, what actually happens? He asks for the ore, and then he's told no. Yeah. And, and that takes eight episodes. And it's <laughs> like, like, he, like the, the ore he was given in, what, episode two or three, that little bit, was actually enough, apparently, for what they need. Right. And and this is where it... Need. It's really the it is like the most expensive fan fiction ever made. Absolutely, because you would think, right? So audiences they 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 actually probably know what Mithril is because we've seen Frodo's uh, hmm. male coat, and you yeah. would think I'm sure there are some people out there, unfortunately, based on what the show has done, asking the question, why didn't Legolas take Frodo's Mithril coat? Like he probably would have wanted that, so the light of the Silmarils could infuse him and make him this this high elf, like. Why didn't he take it from Frodo? And that is so far from... It's it's just such a tangent from what actually the lore is. I am so surprised that they chose to actually do that. Because we saw the leaf. People said maybe this was a lie that yeah. Sauron was spreading. But we saw the Mithra, like, infuse the leaf and, like, heal it. And yeah, it was just insane that they made that choice. Because it is nothing like the lore at all. Mm. I, I was I was I, I thought of you Yoiston when I was watching the show and he tells the story of the the lost Cimmeril mm-hmm. and the fight in front of the tree and the and the lightning going down on the ground. I was like, oh, this this is this is big. <laughs> like this is a big difference. <laughs> we had um, we had a discussion about that. I mean, a... <laughs> we, we we had to we had to we they they got to throw in the Balrog in there somewhere. Like the Balrog yeah. appears for like two minutes, but yep. it, it was most of the the trailers. Yeah. Yeah, I think I made the analogy. Imagine if, like, you were watching a random episode of The Mandalorian and they established that there was now, like, the light side of the force, the dark side of the force, and the green side of the force. Like, you know, yes. it, it, it's like, it's like, <laughs> so, it's such a large, it's such a large lore change that it's, like, very disruptive. It, it's you know? insanely we, disruptive, yeah. We can, well, we, can, we can tolerate small we can tolerate yeah. small changes, but large changes like that, yeah, brutal. I, I know you. I know you hated like the lore changes, but I mean, let's agree that the music was at least good, right? Bear McCreary. Uh, so yes, it was. I was a little bit let down by the music at large because I love the God of War soundtrack. I absolutely love the God of War soundtrack, but you have a couple memorable songs in this. I want to say like the Cause of Doom theme is definitely the one that really stands out for me. Um, Sauron's theme was kind of there, or at least Adar's theme, perhaps. Uh, Galadriel had a bit of a theme, but 
it wasn't I it wasn't definitely like Howard Shores, and maybe that's an unfair comparison, right? Two different composers, two different artists for sure. But Howard Shore's music, I still hear probably like hundreds of hours of his music every year since the mm. sh- since the movies came out. But Bear McCreary's, it was like it was it was good. It was good. I had really high expectations for the music because I do love his work. That coming into it, I was like, okay, right. Even the the main title theme when the Rings of Power intro would be running, I want to say that was actually more Howard Shore, and that was one of the only ones that he actually did for the the uh, show. I was a little bit let down. It, it was good. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say it was really bad or anything like that. But it was. It was fine. It, it was fine. Um, it, it was expensive fanfic. That's that's oof. Yeah. Um, no, I it's have more a, negative than I typically go for sure. But no, no, I understand. I do have a couple of questions. I sent you the 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 article. I'll send yeah. this to Preston here as well. Um, so time put out. Uh, where are you, Preston? So time put out yeah. a article about questions for season two now the the showrunners for season two they're mm. this all being kind of eh, this the show being very mediocre i chopped this down to them being inexperienced showrunners it's like their first thing um but yeah. in an interview about what we can expect from season two they're gonna they, they were saying how oh yeah season two we're gonna do all that stuff that everyone's been complaining about that they wanted to see and people are yeah. gonna walk away from it saying why didn't you do this in the season one because yeah. it was all set up <laughs> Um, so I do have a couple of questions from this yeah. article specifically. Um, where is what? What is in Rune? Because apparently Gandalf or, or the Stranger and Nori they're going to Rune. Is Rune like the Middle East version of, of Middle Earth? Yeah. So it's it's kind of difficult to know for sure what the rest of the world of Arda looks like. You have some bigger maps that Tolkien kind of drafted and and some atlas. There's like a complete atlas of Middle-earth that someone drew up based on their best estimation of, right, this is an English mythology that, that Tolkien made and, and very European, so what would the rest of the world look like? Uh, so you have like in the southeast, you have Harad, and I like this interpretation that some artists have where Harad, actually far Harad looks like the continent of Africa, just the entire continent. Mm-hmm. And so I would say Rune, yeah, to the east would probably be, yeah, your Middle East, your uh, Eurasian kind of territory, uh, your Eastern Europe sort of thing. So with <clears> that, <throat> with like the reason that he's going over there, I can't help but feel that it's probably just a, a, a cheaper tie to another quote within the book, which is Aragorn at the Council of Elrond, Talks about how he went to Rune and the and the stars were strange. <coughs> that was it, right? The stars were strange in the east, and um, he may have also been talking about the south at that point. But I feel like they're like, okay, so he fell from the sky, G- Gandalf or whoever Meteor Man is, fell from the sky. He's trying to figure out these stars. Ooh, the stars are strange, is what Aragorn says. So we're just gonna we're gonna that's enough for us. We're gonna go over to Rune now. That's my interpretation of it. Um, and what about uh, Cedran? I'm probably saying it wrong. Oh, Kirdan. Oh, Kirdan. Sorry, uh, Kirdan. Yeah, no, you're you're good. He gets one of the rings. Um, where where is he around this time? So they they mentioned that they're planning to cast him for season two, uh, Kirdan the shipwright, and so he's supposed to be in Linden. Um, he's he's one of the oldest elves. He's actually one of the only elves in the entire legendarium that rocks a, a beard. Um, Wait, so they can all grow beards, so but they just choose not to? They can if they're old enough and have seen enough. Uh, horrible stuff like oh. if they have become a- aged enough and Kirdan, he had a lot of tragedy in his life that he lived through he yeah he was like older than i want to i want to say he was older if not around as old as galadriel was herself and so like he entered <clears throat> that last <clears throat> elven life cycle of his like the the late adulthood I where see. he could grow a beard yeah hmm. so if we go in the reverse if you're young enough and you haven't really seen much and you're a dwarf can you not have a beard <laughs> <laughs> I mean, actually, in, in dwarven culture, I like that. In dwarven culture, they uh, they kind of judge you by by the beard, right? And so the whole this whole idea, uh, a lot of respect for uh, Tolkien professor, right? But I do respectfully disagree with his take on the whole dwarvish beard thing, right? Dwarves were supposed to be. It's hard to tell if they're women or male, and their beard is a big source of pride for them. Uh, and so the women dwarves should have beards. I, I don't get why they don't. They should totally have beards. But you're right. Young dwarves, man. If you were if you were 20 or 30, man, you were considered a pretty young dwarf with maybe not that <laughs> Well, Well, Feely or Keely, I forget which I've, one. I've, they don't have beards or big beards in The Hobbit, so. Yeah. I, 
I want to say Feely and Killy were some of the youngest mm-hmm. ones, uh, which was why. Okay. Uh, I want to say there were 70 or 80, something like that. They were pretty young. I, I did hear a fan theory that actually, like, dwarves were just super jealous of of um, <clears throat> of people coming in and taking their women so that they, they invented the lie that their wives had beards in order to, like, <laughs> keep men away, from, keep people, keep outsiders away from their women. That's that hilarious. The, uh, that, I heard that fan theory. Yeah. I was like, yeah, you know, I suppose it works. That, yeah. And, and it actually went further and were like, actually, their wives are super hot. And, like, <laughs> they can't. They're like spreading the theory. They're spreading the idea that they're all like have beards. Like, okay. uh, Yosin, where, where is uh, where is Galadriel's at this point in the lore? Where is Galadriel's husband Celeborn? So they uh, they travel together during the Second Age for the most part. There's a, there's an instance where they are split up, but pretty much Galadriel and Celeborn after the fall of Doriath and the destruction of Beleriand after the First Age, they come. Uh, east. They rule like a fiefdom in Linden, part of Gilgalad's kingdom. So they rule together, right? They're married and they rule this part together. Then they lead some elves to a place called Nanuiel, uh, which is where part of Arnor, like the the Elendil kingdom would, would be. They live there uh, alongside the lake for a while. Then they go to Aregion, like the, the land of the, um, the Ringcrafters. And they actually live, both live there for a time. Galadriel and her daughter, uh, and their daughter Celebrian, they decide to go to a place called Lindorinand, which would later be Lothlorien, and they go through Moria. Celeborn, he doesn't like the dwarves, because the, even though it wasn't the same dwarves, dwarves killed his kinsman Thingol, who is like the king of Doriath. So he's like, no, I'm not going through Moria. And then Galadriel and Celebrian were like, okay, sounds good, we'll see you later. So they go through Moria to, which would eventually be Lothlorien. And that is at, and that's right before uh, Sauron invades Aragion. So they're split up during the invasion of Sauron. Celeborn is like a commander, and he's fighting back the forces uh, until Elrond shows up. Together, they go and found Emladris Rivendell in the north, like fleeing from Sauron's forces in Aragion. And eventually, Sauron's defeated and everything. Galadriel and Celebrian they come back through and. Uh, maybe not through, but they at least come back around to Eriador, and then they re meet in Emladris. Uh, that's the first time Elrond and Celebrian meet. And then you have Galadriel and Celeborn. They head to uh, a place in the south named Athelond, or at least near there, which is like a, a southern port in in the lands that would eventually be Gondor. And that's where they end the Damn, age. Damn, like, this is like an entire out. show, just their fucking travels. It's, just, <clears throat> oh, it's a whole show. Yeah, yeah. no, it's it's legit. It's legit, for so, sure. And, <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you, I mean, do you think it was odd that they added sexual tension between Galadriel and Halbrand. Yeah, it was <laughs> like... so annoying. Oh, for sure. And and again, this is the part of me that's like, this was written by committee, is what it feels like. It feels like there were eight writers in the room that voted on what seemed to be the best and what seemed to fit the most general audiences. It didn't feel like an actual re- legitimate story. Uh, it felt like a 2022 story, right? Because you just have uh, Galadriel and, yeah, this random guy, and then there's this weird tension. And then, of course, it happens to be Sauron. And then Sauron's like, I'm trying to make you my queen. She's like, I don't want it. And then he just leaves her. Even after she rejects him, he doesn't, you know, drown right, her then, in that river. Then why, <laughs> why were we, you don't want it. Why were we bickering for, for why were we bickering in a, in a sexual tension TV way for eight episodes? Yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, she, the fact that, I mean, Sauron, right, he was the deceiver. He couldn't, like, the fact that she couldn't quite detect him kind of makes sense, especially with how stupid that she is in the show. <laughs> and in the yeah, book, yeah. she actually, uh, when Anatar in his fair form, when he comes to Linden, I want to say Galadriel and Gogolod and maybe even Elrond, they were all like, ooh, we're not sure about this guy. And then he goes over to Celebrimbor, and Celebrimbor's like, oh, sweet, you want to teach us some things. Cool. But they actually are like, oh, even in his form, we're not sure about this guy. We don't know who he is, but we don't quite like him, you know? Uh, it's weird. And that's, I mean, it at least answered part of the question that I had. I didn't think it had, I didn't think Sauron could be Halbrand because she was like drowning, right? She was getting pulled under the ocean. And then Halbrand went and saved her in episode three or two. I'm not going to lie, though. Like that scene of them when he's trying to convince her to be his queen and you see them in the water's reflection. That was that was pretty cool. But then then they kind of ruined it. I mean, not kind of. They definitely ruined it with the close up shot of them yelling at each other. Like that was really dumb. But maybe he let her live because maybe he needs her for some stupid reason. 
need, yeah. needed her to be the connection into the into the elves so he can tell yeah. them about the alloy. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> uh, my last question, no, by no, the way, <laughs> I have one last question because this is something I always get confused about. So there's this YouTuber. Um, he, I, I, I always make this joke to Preston. I've, I've said this before as well. There's this one YouTuber who is phenomenal at making these types of, of videos. And I'm surprised he doesn't do it more often. CGP Grey. Yep. He has one yep. of the best Lord of the Rings, like, explanation videos of the lore ever. And uh, it's been a minute yeah. since I've actually seen them. But he, he explains about the rings. The rings help keep everything big and beautiful and wonderful. The ones that, the, the, the three yeah. rings that were made in the last episode. Yeah, especially Galadriel's ring, Nenya. Um, he's right about that. So so what are, so what do they do? What are the powers so, of it? No, that's a great question. So when, um, with Galadriel, we'll start with her ring. So Nenya... Uh, she uses that power during the, like, really during the Third Age especially to keep Lothlorien, which would be eventually right, become her realm. She would use that to keep it uh, safe from enemies and powerful and everything growing. But after the destruction of the One Ring, that was part of the reason why she decided to go into the West, because her, the power of her ring was gone. And so Lothlorien would diminish. It wouldn't be this beautiful luxurious like just luscious place wait but i thought i thought the the one ring wasn't really tied to the three the three because they were not really connected to so sauron. yes and no right so he they were still made through the knowledge that sauron gave to Celebrimbor, but they were never touched by his hands personally so because they were made through the the um the knowledge of sauron they were still like in the Bluetooth connection, if you will. Because if Sauron had the one ring, all of the elves would take their ring off. Because he would dominate their minds. And uh, and that's kind of the case in the Second Age. They didn't really wear their rings until after the one ring was lost. Because the moment that, they, that Sauron built the one ring and he was like, Sweet, I'm about to dominate the elves. He put his ring on. They sensed each other. The elves said, oh, we've, you know, we've been deceived. And then Sauron was like, oh, crap, they built three extra rings that I didn't know about. I'm going to go wage war on them now. Uh, and and that so it's it's yes and no. They were the purest. They were good rings, but they were still made with his knowledge. And so after the destruction of the one ring, the three elven rings faded. So with Galadriel's ring, yeah, that was the case with Lothlorien. With Vilia, Elrond, Gilgalad's ring and then Elrond's ring, he used that in mm. Rivendell. And I imagine that's probably where a lot of the power of, of Rivendell came from, right? We see uh, the Ford of Bruning with the, the horses, right, in the in the water. I imagine some of that was from his ring, which was, right, the Ring of Air. Galadriel's was the Ring of Water. And it kept Rivendell probably what it was. And finally, the Ring of Fire, um, uh, Narya, was cured in the shipwrights. But then when Gandalf set foot on Middle-earth... He said, you're going to need this more than I do because I see that you'll, I foresee that you have a lot more hardship in front of you. And so Gandalf used that ring to inspire courage. The ring of fire was all about kindling hope and mm. kindling the fire within one's heart. So Bilbo, right? Bilbo leaving to go on a, a quest. Frodo going, all of that, I imagine he used uh, Narya a little bit to inspire them, to give them <clears throat> confidence and courage. If that, I imagine if each that season sense. they're going to deal with the different set of rings. Like this is how the elven mm-hmm. rings were were created. Maybe next season is going to be how the dwarven rings and then the, how the men's rings will will be yeah. built or something. It could totally be that <clears> way. <throat> um, the the interesting thing is like you know Sauron didn't. And again, this is from the lore. They could totally change this as they've changed almost everything. But in the lore, there were only sixteen uh, greater rings, right? You had these random lesser rings, and the amount of them we're not sure. But you had sixteen greater mm. rings, and he was trying. The the elves originally had these, but when Sauron waged war, he reclaimed these, and that sixteen <clears> became <throat> nine for men and and seven for dwarves. So um, I yeah, that wasn't the original intention yeah. of those rings. I don't believe, but maybe maybe they were. What I wanted, I wanted to ask about like one of the major themes of the season seemed to be, um, uh, children rebelling against their parents yeah. and their community and what that means, like whether it's done for for good or or bad. Um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, uh, on the on the mill front, you've got her son <laughs> like se- seeking seeking out the sword and realizing that 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 was a bad route. You have you. Have uh, Isildur, Il, Isildur, Dur, I, I can't yeah, even pronounce it. things. I sound yeah. horrible. Isildur, like 
like um having his tension with his father and 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 trying to uh um trying to to be part of the military and then his father rejecting him and him trying to get in and then i guess he he dies but he's, he can't really be dead because he's he's going to appear later right and then durin re, you know rebelling against his father and the settled ways and then mm. nori um also like re, you know going against her her community and her and her parents and and like you know protecting the meteor man and things like that yeah um it it's <sighs> I don't know. Like, is that ever a Tolkien kind of theme? Like, like children rejecting the the old ways and 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 going against like their parents. Like, it's just like I mean, it's an interesting thing for the show, and and I, and I appreciate like the parallels and all the stories, and it creates a lot of the tension. But it, it didn't seem very Tolkien to me. I'm not sure I, uh, if if yeah yeah. I no, I I agree. I, yeah, it's it's interesting. Again, these themes, like, I very much came at this show from a lore perspective. But, yeah, these themes that you picked yeah. up on, for sure. Um, I would agree with you. It's generally not a Tolkienian theme. Because a lot of Tolkien, a lot of his characters are honor thy father, that sort of thing. Versus, like, mm. go against thy father. Uh, f- with a couple instances that are, are maybe changed, right? You have, like... Right, like, the best the best thing you can do is to, like keep a tradition for a thousand years secretly and, and like continue yeah. it on for, you know, like that's yeah. the greatest thing you could fucking do. Exactly. <laughs> well, yeah. And that's totally what we see with like the Rangers who were, yeah, for over a thousand years, the uh, chieftains of the Dunedain who were actually the descendants of Kings, they were in wait and they honored the traditions and, and protected their people. But you do have some instances Right, so I would say the whole Baggins going on an adventure sort of thing with Bil- Bilbo and less so Frodo because he's following in Bilbo's footsteps, but Bilbo, I mean, he's kind of, he's different, right? He's he's going against the general traditions of hobbits and he's actually going on that adventure. Uh, but you can still see that his hobbitish side is with him the whole time, right? It's not like he's rejecting, um, he says, oh, I wish I was an elf or something like that per se and that I wasn't a hobbit. He's still missing his home. He's still the kind of reluctant hero, but you also have instances like Faramir where Faramir, he, you know, he honors his father in a traditional sense, but through Den, he doesn't honor his father because he doesn't bring him the ring. You know, he goes against Mm. the wishes of his father uh, by letting Frodo, Sam and Gollum continue on in their adventure, both in the book and in the movie. And it's like, to some degree, there's a bit of rebellion, but it's for a greater sense of virtue that, that, um, we can even see as an audience where it's like, yeah, maybe he went against Denethor, but he, he did something that was even greater than what a sealed could do because the door took the ring, but Faramir gave it up. He, he let Frodo <clears throat> go. So the, yeah. it's, yeah, it is interesting. It is interesting, but you're right. In almost every plot line there, there are those themes present for sure. This is fascinating. Cause I, I think, I think we're, uh, we're, we're unlocking perhaps one of the, the big, the big fundamental problems here is mm-hmm. that um, I don't like a lot of people are like, Oh, the, the writing, the writing is horrible. And I'm like, no, it's not, it's not horrible. It's, it's, it's fine. It's, it's, it's pretty standard middle of the road, like show writing. Yeah. Um, and I yep. think, I think like looking at the themes, cause like the show does seem to have themes and it has parallel structures and it has all of these things going on. Um, we find classic kind of show stuff. Yeah. romances sexual tension rebellion of children against parents um Absolutely. like the, the the sort of classic ways that stories create tension are here um you know even even the uh the the father the father the, fa- the, the dark elf and his relationship with the orcs like mm-hmm. these are like this is all very new in 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 a tolkien sense but yeah. not necessarily new in any modern show any modern totally. show like totally. you know um, and I think this may be the thing is that they're really, they were, they were taking the round peg and shoving it in the square hole Yeah. in that, you know, we're, we're adapting Tolkien, which perhaps isn't really adaptable, even though like people are like, mm. you know, like <laughs> I understand that even, you know, people love Peter Jackson and all, but I do wonder if Tolkien is even, even adaptable. Yeah. Um, yeah, with, for sure. With, with 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 like real Tolkien themes, because even Peter Jackson is pretty dour and sad, and mm-hmm. doesn't really get the, the the Tolkien feel of of Lord of the Rings. Um, the uh, and I think yeah, I think they're writing it like it's a it's a regular like fantasy action series, and they're adding all of the things that a regular show should have. Yeah, 
but those things don't necessarily apply to Tolkien, exactly. right? Like, I think you, I think you definitely like Galadriel is the the, the perfect example because she's she's this person with a chip on her shoulder who makes all these mistakes, who's rash, who's exciting, who yeah. has sexual tension with with this character and tension with this character, and there's a conflict. But in reality, if she's a if she's thousands of years old, like. And she's super experienced. She wouldn't be that character, you know. Yeah. She's Arya. She's essentially Arya or Luke. Like it's Absolutely. it's it's a weird character arc for this. Uh, by the way, you mentioned bad writing. So I this is is this something you agree with, uh, Yoiston? That some of the dialogue was kind of eh. Yeah. So a couple things that um, other reviews and other reviewers have pointed out that I didn't even necessarily notice was like how how characters used like euphemisms from the modern day. So I didn't really catch mm. this a lot, but I want to say it was like uh, a YouTuber critical drinker who said this on some of his reviews. <laughs> and I tried to get all around did all these different reviews, right. To kind of get, Preston, you know, ideas. critical drinker, right? <laughs> yep. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I, I obviously don't, I don't agree with everything he says for sure. But like there, he brought up some interesting things and that was one is that ha- the half or the Harfoots, they said, okay, a lot. One thing that I picked mm, up on yeah. that that I could I don't think anyone else really like talked about in the reviews that I watched was that a sealed door in uh, episode three uh, I want to say he said nah you go somebody said hey you want to go do this thing or whatever he said nah you go mm. and I I was I have the subtitles on I, I like to kind of just pick up on on those things and I was like what are you doing either maybe that was an sure. actor mistake but it, it's little things not the care that even goes into like House yeah. of the Dragon. No, but that happens in House of the Dragon too. Like oh, really? I, you know, like oh my god. Like well, I I did a whole thing here about how Bartimo Celtigar says that something's moot, and I'm like, oh my god, that's like such a modern euph- euphemism. To Is call it actually moot. though? Come on, like it, oh, it's, it's, yeah. it's ice and fire. Moot, like they. Moot- no, I mean it's especially wrong in ice and fire, considering you have the fucking king's moot using the word like in the old sense. <laughs> that's right. Mo- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> moot, you know, moot, moot in the modern sense meaning irrelevant is a very new thing. You can't have uh, yeah. like being, you know, like, and so they do this all yeah. the time, too. That's fair. It, I, so I, I was thinking like I ent, do think, ent moot in Lord of the Rings, yeah. Yeah, like, like moot, moot means something that's open for debate in, in, it's only in a modern sense do we now say, oh, it's kind of irrelevant. Um, uh so it's interesting. You know, okay. They, yeah. they screw up. They screw up. Let me well, I let mean, me defend or, the show or, for a bit because because this is something like you guys saying it has bad dialogue and and all that stuff. I don't know about that. So I want to show you guys something real quick. Maybe Preston have seen this. I know you probably didn't. Um, you ever see Spartacus, Yoiston, the show Spartacus? No, I haven't. But Preston, have you seen Spartacus? <laughs> Uh, I, 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 I've only seen pieces. I've never seen the whole thing. So a lot of Lord of the Rings actors are in Spartacus and vice versa, right? For example, um, who is the wood elf that comes to help out in uh, Two Towers at the very end of Helm's oh, Deep? Oh, Hal, uh, Haldir. Haldir. So Haldir is in Spartacus, right? So this is it's mm-hmm. ancient Rome and uh, about the Servile Rebellion and all that stuff. And here's the, the – I want to show you guys this clip. So here's the premise. The premise is Marcus Crassus is – if you don't know him, he's one of history's most richest men. And Haldir's wife, Haldir is a Roman lieutenant here, Haldir's wife kills Marcus Crassus' cousin. That's the, that's the gist of it, right? So one second, boys. This is, this is the dialogue from this fucking show, right? Here it is. Hold on. So that's the basic premise. He's, he's chastising her for this act. I am bound to the house of Batiatus by patronage granted only to bury knowledge of the blood staining your hands. What happened to Lycinia was an accident. She was the cousin of Marcus Crassus. She was a fucking bitch. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look. I... It took you out of uh, it a little bit. What I'm gonna, the reason I bring this up is because I keep hearing everyone complain about how Rings of Power has bad dialogue. That's bad dialogue right there. That is, that is fucking trash dialogue. I've heard way worse than what Rings of Power has come up with. So I, I can't sit here and say that, yeah, the dialogue here is bad. I don't know. Like, elves have always sounded like fedora-wearing virgins, tr- like, trying to quote poetry. They, To me, at least, they've always sounded like that. They've always sounded like weirdo incels. And I, I guess it's more highlighted here because it's not Peter Jackson doing it, I guess. I, I And I like in the example I gave, like, it could be so much worse than than what we got. Right, but at the same time, at the same time, it's a little ridiculous that 
it's a really really ridiculous that when we watch stuff from the Roman era, we always want snooty British actors to be Romans, yeah. which doesn't <laughs> make any fucking sense. That's true. You know, like like you know, so like it's the same. Or when they show, I I I think I once watched some show where where the person playing Jesus was like a Southern California dude who had like a Southern <laughs> California accent. And everyone's like, what? And you're like, well, that accent is just as, as accurate as any other freaking accent. I mean, you know, so why not that accent? Um, so I, I, I think it's a bit of that. Like we, we have this like idea of what fantasy people should talk like, but that's not how they talked in the middle ages. It's, there was never a period of time where anyone ever talked like that. So it's just, it's just there. I don't well, know. So I just sent this to you guys. This was a, an actual line that serious writers wrote for Durin, the prince of the dwarves. Give me the meat and give it to me raw. <laughs> <laughs> yep. yep. I remember that line, but his delivery of it wasn't bad. Uh, no, I, I remember the, that line. The line give itself, the though. Give it to me raw. <laughs> well, it, like I said, it's not as bad as, as you know, it, but she was a fucking bitch. Like, it's not that bad. Yeah. And to be fair, yeah. Spartacus no, no. is very, like, Spartacus is more sexy than educational. That's, that's, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. But, but how, you know, how often is, how often to say House of the Dragon say something like he's, the person's a, you know, a fucking cunt and stuff, you know, like that. True. That, Damon that said kind of that. stuff happens all the time. Yeah. Right, which is like, oh, that's very, that's very like 1995 soccer hooligan of you. But is it really like something someone would be saying in in Westeros or you know, 1500s, you know, yeah. whatever? No, yeah, that's so, fair. And it, it, you're right. I mean, it's it's tough to write like that. But I didn't get that feel in a big sense. Maybe there were a couple scripts here and there, but like with uh, with Peter Jackson's films i didn't i felt like you know they were talking in a way that i associated it with with middle earth you know uh but Mm. it was inconsistent to say the least in in rings of power um because you uh you mentioned house of the dragon do you you want to get into house of the dragon now because before we started the recording you said you had some questions and comments and whatnot yeah, so I think a, a perfect transition, right, to show the quality, and I've mentioned this to, to my friend Royan, right, so the quality of uh, Rings of Power versus House of the Dragon. So in Rings of Power Episode 8, you have the death of Tar Palantir on his deathbed, and he's mistaking um, Elendil's daughter as his own daughter, Tar Miriel. And Tar mm. Palantir, right, he mistakes her, and, you know, he pretty much kind of is prophetic in a sense, right? He allows her to go up to the plantier. And then simultaneously in House of the Dragon, I think it was like earlier that same week, you have King Viserys dying, thinking Alicent was his daughter and speaking about uh, prophecies. Now, of course, I doubt they knew about each other when they were making these scenes, but did you guys, I imagine you felt the, you know, the heartstrings being pulled with Viserys and his death. Oh, Tarpalantir, yes. man. We saw him, like, did you feel that way with Tarpalantir? No. <laughs> well, he only had, like, one scene before, right? Like, yeah. he was a nobody. Yeah. Yeah, he was a nobody. I, I don't know. I, I feel like that's a bit unfair, considering that Viserys is one of the main central characters in House of the Dragon. And it, it doesn't help that they got Patty Constantine, who was just a phenomenal actor, and it, it just a lot of stuff went into it. So, and there are a lot of episodes focused on him specifically, or a lot of the main episodes' plot lines were, you know, Viserys-centric, so, and I, the guy, the, the king here, he had, what, less than five, four minutes of screen time, maybe? Maybe three lines of dialogue, and that's it? So that's a little unfair. Sure, but, but like, if they expected to make this scene, and to have people care, I'm not saying that they have to care as much as, like, it, we did with Viserys, because he was our guy for, like, eight episodes, mm-hmm. right? But... Uh, they don't we don't have to care that much but it's not super i don't you know it wasn't probably what they intended because it's like oh that guy's dead now okay but it it was shot in a way that felt like oh we're supposed to care it's maybe the old ways are dying right the the ways of the faithful uh uh-oh maybe they're going with him but nah they didn't really express that and i feel like part of that was the pacing of the show uh, House of the Dragon definitely has some pacing issues too, but the pacing of Rings of Power for sure, it's like we were just jumping, man. We were just going from place to place and action set and to action set or whatever it was, right? It didn't feel super co- coherent. Again, House of the Dragon seems to have a couple problems with that. Um, you know, they've had multiple time skips and, and that's okay. It's just been hard to follow like and to really get invested in characters that get their heads cut off like that same episode. <laughs> 
So, Yorsin, did you have any more uh, questions that you wanted to ask or go into in regards to House of the Dragon? Because me and Preston, we've been doing the reviews, and he, you made a good point, Preston, a while ago about how all the ep- almost every single House of the Dragon episode, f- great, except they do this one teeny tiny thing that makes it from being perfect. <laughs> Wait, what thing is that? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I wouldn't say it's necessarily tiny, but it's usually they have a really fucking perfect episode and then they do a shock. They do a shock event uh, yeah. that doesn't necessarily make any sense. Um, and then and then everybody's kind of reeling from it. And, you know, and that shock event can be um, in the first episode, you've got the, the killing of the people at the at the at the um, at the tourney, like six people mm-hmm. dying like yep. in succession. And then. You know, later we've got, um, uh, you know, Kristen Cole <clears throat> killing Joffrey Lonmouth. And then we have, you know, Rhaenyra breaking out in, in the dragon pit and, 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 you know, killing hundreds of people. Like there's, yeah. there's a shock event that, that doesn't necessarily work. You know, yeah. I, I understand why they did it. You know, they, they want their red wedding moment in every single episode, but it doesn't necessarily like actually narratively work because then everybody's like, wait, how, how does that make sense? Like everybody has the, the ham sandwich moment. Um, yeah. Ham, ham sandwich moment is the, uh, uh, Alfred Hitchcock said that like, you know, um, a lot of times you watch a movie and then there's the, some, some great scene. And then later in the night you're, 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 you're getting a snack and you're eating a ham sandwich and you realize that the movie doesn't make sense. Like, you, you know, <laughs> so that's, like yeah, it. that's so he always talks about the ham sandwich moment. Yeah. Oh, yeah. by the way, real quick before we move on, someone left a comment in my comment section about how season one of House of the Dragon, which is adapted from the Fire and Blood history book, uh, is only 80 pages of the first few Dance of the Dragon chapters in that book. Is that true? I don't remember. It's been a minute since we've covered it. Because for those of you who don't remember, we did cover Fire and Blood for like quite some time before the start of House of the Dragon. Oh, I never counted because they do get it, it. It's hard to tell a little bit because when they jump to Luke, they they leave behind some Jace. So like, um, so so it's not like you can't just like open it up and go directly. But um, it wouldn't surprise me if it's something like eighty pages. I mean, I can look it up right now. Um, but yeah, it's 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 going to be something like that because it's at least um, one third of the entire book. So I actually recently did a uh, a review kind of breakdown discussion kind of of Rise of the Dragon, the new one that just came out. It's basically an abbreviated yeah. version of Fire and Blood. However, in Fire and Blood, it has like seven hundred pages. I, I think a third of that is the Dance of the Dragons. Yeah, the Dance of the Dragons is close to being a third of of Fire and Blood. Um, I mean, it depends where you start the Dance of the Dragons, but, like, do you start the Dance of the Dragons at the Rogue Prince, or do you actually start it with, like, the dying of the dragons as they start... The Blacks and the Greens. Saying, but, like, yeah, the Blacks and the Greens. By the way, you yeah. said, let me ask you this. Uh, since you're somewhat of a casual when it comes to Ice and Fire, have you read House, uh, Fire and Blood or any of the Ice and Fire novels? Uh, let's see. I've only read Game of Thrones, but I've listened to, like, the lore videos that you, know, you, you both have done, other people have done, to get a more holistic telling of it uh recently i just listened to what the show i think you know like the the epilogues carmine right that you posted of just like all the random stories that the actors from game of thrones uh narrated did you in any way shape or form since you watched the whole thing and you were paying attention because we were paying attention too did you get any idea of why they would be called the greens or what rainier's faction is called and why they're called that that was a little bit lazy writing of the uh, on the showrunners part or whoever it was when <laughs> uh, they said right it was um, it was strong I can't remember his name the the little finger of the strongs oh Laris um, La- uh, yeah Laris yeah. It, he that he like said it at dinner when she came in in that green dress and it's like oh, when when the high towers wear green or when they when they do green this is what that means and. Uh, if I if there was not that line in there, I would not have known that at all. But their but their faction, um, Allison's faction, and Otto's like them, all of them. They're called the Greens. Yeah, the Greens. It randomly comes out I of nowhere. I don't know. Did you catch it? it yeah, no, it, it does come out of absolutely nowhere. Like the Greens have a little bit of that explanation in that wedding scene, uh, but the Blacks have no explanation. I'm not sure why. I guess Dragonstone is cut black. I guess I don't know. <laughs> 
Uh, the the explanation doesn't even quite make sense. The explanation doesn't quite make sense in the books either. Um, oh, okay. So at so they're having a five year anniversary feast for Allison's five year mm. wedding anniversary, and Allison wears a green dress, and Rhaenyra wears a black and red dress, and after that they just people start referring to them as the greens and the blacks. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> Even though her dress was both black and red. And red. You know, like, yeah, that's strange. That's right. Weird. And and that's that's honestly all there is to it in the books. Like there's no oh. like it's it's the high tower flame. Even though the high tower flame is green when they go to war, like that that's a, a show a show only addition, which makes sense, like, but that she was making a statement. Yeah. But um yeah, and and it's not really explained who or why everybody starts referring to them as the blacks and the greens. Just like wait a minute, show, wait a minute. So they, hold yes. on, that's that's a show only thing that the high tower, the the actual lighthouse, it, it, it burns green. That's that no, that that that's a thing that's mentioned in Fire and Blood, but it's mentioned much earlier. It's mentioned during the the Magor Wars, um, the uh, and the association of green being war and her dress that connection is a show only connection well the reason i ask is because it's it's fairly different in the books and how they, they did it in the show but the show yeah. did it very well yeah, very yeah, well done. absolutely i mean there, there's just no reason to why she was given a green dress she just happened to be wearing a green dress the show the show yeah, was like oh let's give it a reason the green the, the high tower flame is green and that's war you know like, oh, that's yeah so you know the, that's the thing is every once in a while you're like, oh, that's a really cool, that's a really cool addition. Like, nice, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah I can so. tell. I mean, it definitely helps too, right? That's one of the differences with Rings of Power and, and House of the Dragon is it's like the ability to reference source material. Um, you know, if Rings of Power had the Unfinished Tales and the Silmarillion, which they don't, uh, if they actually had the rights to those, that this show would have been a lot better, I think, because then they could actually... They wouldn't have to do these half-hearted references where they name one of the Valar yeah. and not all of them. And do they have do they have to be different? Do they have to actually like choose a different path intentionally in order not to violate rights? I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure to be honest. I and to be fair, I I don't know how deep this goes because they show Valinor and they show um, the city of Tyrion mm. and they show like the destruction of the two trees and it's like well okay some of that's referenced in the appendices which are the rights that they do have access to but I mean it's definitely not like with House of the Dragon where they're literally working with the author uh, and, yeah. you know let alone have the source have access to the source material but they're working with the author which obviously you know Rings of Power can't do but it would be much the show would be much better if they had rights to the Unfinished Tales so Right. HBO, HBO's, HBO's deal is that they bought, HBO's deal is they bought all of George R. Martin's work in, in, in its entirety, blanket. Wow. Uh, which means they got everything, inclu- uh, the only thing they didn't get, and it's only for like a minor weird reason, is Night Flyers. And that's only because George sold the rights to that earlier. Oh. And, and so, so like they own all of his Thousand Worlds stuff too. But wow. like, it's, it's, I, I, I was reading about, um, yeah, they have exclusive rights to every sing every single thing that George R. R. Martin's ever written, except for Night Flyers. Now, but I was thinking about like um, I was reading about the copyright of Superman, and so Superman goes into the public domain fairly soon, mm-hmm. but not really because like Superman appears, but he doesn't fly, for example, for like another couple of years. And then he, like Kryptonite isn't introduced for like another ten years, so it's like you can have a Superman story, but how much of it is it really Superman? And so, say you say Superman enters the public domain, but Superman flying has not entered the public domain. Like, could you, you know, if you showed your Superman flying, would you be sued? And then do you purposely go in a different direction and make him a super swimmer? You know. Because you don't want to get sued, you know, like That's interesting. Um, even though even though something base as basic as Superman flying is is like a very easy logical place for the story to go, but because you don't have rights to Superman flying, you have to go in a completely different direction. And I wonder about this with like with with Rings of Power, like they have the rights to Lord of the Rings and the appendices, but they don't have the rights to the Silmarillion, so they purposely have to do a different plot. They purposely have to piss you off. 
Yeah. <laughs> because they don't yeah. have the rights. What I don't understand is, like, Amazon, like, I, we all thought, and I was telling this to Preston a while ago, we all thought that their offer, the reason they got the rights to this stuff, is because they put the most money down. They didn't. Um, they had the least shitty idea. So, yeah. so I think, so why doesn't the Tolkien estate just give Amazon more leeway on certain things? I, to be honest, I, I mean, again, it's, it's a, it's a back and forth, right? It's it's a double edged sword because it's like, well, maybe Rings of Power could have been better if it was Silmarillion, if it did have access and all that. But on the other hand, it could have been just cheapened. It could have been that Amazon took uh, the legacy of not only J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, the you know the works that he spent his entire life on, but also those that of his son Christopher Tolkien, who just mm. recently passed away two years ago, who stewarded all of that work and taking all of that and then just crapping on it. Right, so at the very least, yeah. I'm happy that they're not doing that to, like, the Silmarillion, which I would argue... Like, there's an argument to be made. I mean, Tolkien obviously loved The Hobbit, loved The Lord of the Rings, but the Silmarillion was where his heart was. That was the story of Baron and Luthien that connected him and his wife, right? That was the tale of the elves and the beginnings of, of all of this stuff. It was how he could explore uh, religious idea, ideas and metaphysical ideas and philosophy and all this kind of stuff within fantasy i feel like that was where his heart really was with the elves and their beginning and all of that and so part of me is glad that that remains under tight lock and key because i don't want to see a company like amazon just ruin it what about hbo oh i think the talk <laughs> i think uh, well, hbo would ruin it too you yeah, know that I think, I think you know so. that Gal- if hbo had it you know that like galadriel's tits are getting shown yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know that <laughs> and, and i don't know man like I want you, but but I want to think about how genius the Tolkien estate is and how careful they are. Because one, they're like, okay, we're going to take a little less money now, but you've got to be really careful with the material. Don't do anything too outrageous with it. And even though Yoisin would would say that stuff outrageous stuff has been done, I don't mm-hmm. think like thematically, image wise, mm-hmm. anything has been done. Like totally. it's still it's you know it's still pretty you know I don't know G rated is the right word, but it's still like wholesome Tolkien, right? Yeah. Um so like the 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 IP has not been ruined. But then they went and they fucking like held off on giving the Silmarillion so that everyone sits there and R- Lord of the Rings like this Rings of Power gets released and everyone's like, well we never really got a real prequel. And so some fucking grandkid, <laughs> like 50 years, 60 years can sell the Silmarillion rights and then event then they're gonna redo it and be like, finally we get the Silmarillion. Like they double they're double dipping. It could it know? totally could be. It totally could be, but I think if if at least the ideals of Tolkien and Christopher Tolkien have carried on into what the Tolkien estate is now, it's not about the money. And in fact, I want to say that um, Christopher and J.R.R., they weren't entirely happy that they sold the rights to The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit to be made into films either. Like, even Tolkien, who did it himself, like, he did it, I think, because he was, at the time, like, kind of, he, he needed the money at, at a certain point. And um, if if I recall, I'm kind of hazy on this story, but I want to say that there are there are sentiments out there uh, that were just like, what if they didn't even sell the rights to any mm-hmm. of it? Because like you said earlier, I, I it's will, not a, not adaptable, which obviously I'm very happy will, that they did sell the rights. But yeah, I will tell you, actually, the, the, the real reason in my mind on why they they uh, sold Lord of the Rings rights and not Silmarillion rights is I bet Lord of the Rings rights are under the names of uh, is under the name of J.R. Tolkien, while I bet Silmarillion rights are under Christopher Tolkien because he's the one that put that together. Yeah. So seventy whatever the seventy five yeah, years true. from death of the author, they get to keep Silmarillion rights for another seventy three years, while yep. um, while Lord of the Rings goes into the public domain. I don't know, like when was Lord of the uh, when did when did Tolkien die? Uh, nineteen nineteen seventy three. So you know, it's nineteen seventy three. So that they they got a lot of, another thirty years on the, those rights, but yeah. I think it's I think it's that. Interesting. I think they're like, well, yeah, let's 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 you know use the one that's going to go into public domain earlier, and then keep the ones that are that are Christopher sure. Tolkien's. Sure, that makes that makes a lot of sense too. Yeah, it's it's an interesting debate, but like. No, I'm, you know, I'm obviously glad that nothing crazy has gone down from, like, reactions to Rings of Power, but the the 
the fandoms are so passionate. They're built differently than other fandoms. And I think it's just, I mean, right. You think of the beginnings of the Hobbit, right? Where Tolkien was grading, you know, infamously grading a paper in, uh, and it was, he just like turned it over and just, it came to him in a hole in the ground. There lived a Hobbit, right? And he just like started. And then he shared the story with his children. And then Christopher Tolkien was like, Hey dad, you said last time that their hoods were green, not blue. And then he's like, dang it. You're right. <laughs> and then he went back and changed oh my it. God. And, like, like from if, even, if you, if you ever have like, if you like when you guys have kids, like yeah. toddlers are just like, Honestly, like my my kid every day is like, Daddy, 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 Daddy. How many how many urinals were were in the train station bathroom? And I'm like, ah, I don't know, five. <laughs> and he's like, he's like, Daddy, Daddy. I think there were six. I was like, fine, okay, there there were six. And he's like, Daddy, were you wrong? <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I was wrong. Oh, I was shit. like, like that shit. That shit happens every day. That was literally oh Tolkien God. with like the green Hobbit door. Like he said, it was like a different yeah. color or something like that, or that the that oh the knob God. was in the center versus at the side, something like that. And then Christopher Tolkien was like, "Hold on a second, uh." Oh my God, it's it's so it. Like the minute you were like, "Oh, it's Christopher," like like corrected him. I was like, "Oh my yeah. God, yeah." No, <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, but uh, no, so. Uh, so HBO has a bit of an advantage here because George, you know, has probably come in and helped out Ryan Condal with a lot of, like, you know, the, the stuff behind the scenes. But uh, for the most part, like I said, me and Preston, we've been, we've been you know, fairly satisfied with how House of the Dragon turned out. I'm assuming, Joyston, you are as well. You, you found some good entertainment from it. Yeah, well, and I, I, we talked, right? We talked after the first couple of episodes came out and you said you know, you've been watching House of the Dragon, right? And I said, no, I've still got the bad taste of season eight in my mouth. And I just, I don't know, I'm not really motivated to to jump back into it. But then I heard enough good things about it and my friends were watching it and all that. I'm like, all right, I'll give it a shot. And then the moment I did, I'm like, oh yeah, no, I'm back. I'm like back in it. And now I'm getting back into the lore and like learning about it all again. And it's it's so good. It's just so entertaining. And, and I think even Game of Thrones sent out like a, at least I saw this as like a meme. Maybe they didn't actually send this out, but on like Twitter, uh, a Game of Thrones page said, you know, uh, Rings of Power can throw millions of dollars at making like a dragon, but we make a man dying in a, an old man dying in a chair a lot more interesting, something like that. And I'm like, yeah, mm. you guys did, <laughs> you know, like, okay, cool. Uh, Meteor Man and, and Mount Doom going off. Okay. But the series dying, man, that stuck with me. That one, that one hit me right in the heart. And it just shows the difference, again, in the caliber of writing and the caliber of passion that went into either of these projects. And like you said, it's, you know, the author's right there to make sure that things are kind of going accordingly. Um, But this show is closer to the source material, right, than like Rings of Power is to that source material like almost not at all right it's so weird how like close the, the how close the show is and then at the same time it's not for example yeah. th- this is what i was telling Preston. like they mentioned joanna swan which mm-hmm. was like it's like one sentence in fire and blood yeah. about this woman who was carried off by mm-hmm. uh, uh essos pirates and then they sell her off to like a pleasure house in lease and she eventually works her way up to like essentially be the ruler of Lise and all but name. They mentioned that in episode three, like pass in passing, like, wow, okay, they read Fire and Blood. And then you have the Lanor stuff. Uh, Price, do you want to tell them about like what happened with Lanor or? So, so Lanor in the show, they decide to do a fake out death and have the yeah. character survive yeah. when he, when he actually like dies in the book and which, you know, makes our hero Rhaenyra into a, mur- a murderer because they murder a random person yeah. and do a body swap. Right. And it's, it's such an odd change because all of a sudden you're like, oh, God, like now now I hate this character because they murdered a random person yeah. <laughs> just so that another character plus his dragon is left behind. And so he has like what happens to that dragon that he has a telepathic connection to. And I was thinking about all that this too. kind of weird yeah. shit. I so, yeah. Uh, whether it's close to the source material, it's weird because it's it's both at once. Like, they'll make major changes to the source material, like really fundamental major changes to the source material that are sometimes better, sometimes worse. So I think, um, for instance, Rhaenyra and Alicent being friends, which is a fundamental part of the story. If there is any if there is any theme that actually goes from episode to episode, it's the friendship of 
and and I'd say my biggest the, my biggest complaint about House of the Dragon is the fact that the individual episodes are great, but they don't have any like overarching theme to the ten episodes. Yeah. Um, which I would say that like at least you know it rings of power with all of its flaws. At least it it did like have it, an overarching tale. Um, true. True. You know, like what what happened in episode three doesn't contradict what happened in episode six. You can't say that with House of the Dragon. House of the Dragon, like each episode kind of contradicts the one before, but each episode individually is like far better directed, entertaining, paced, you know, acted than anything in Rings of Power um, yeah. by far. So yeah. it's it's really weird. So like that fundamental change of like making Alicent and, and Rhaenyra the same age and best friends works really well it works much better than the source material um but no one no one there's no one that loves the source material there's no one that thinks of fire and blood as like this great freaking genius book that you're going to read over and over again and rank in in your top in your top five favorite books fire and blood is kind of crap like it's something that george (laughs) r R. martin shat out you know (laughs) yeah because it's written like a dry history right it's written like uh yeah okay and the only thing that's interesting about the dry history is that it's written ambiguously from a biased perspective so that you can like what what's interesting about it is like puzzling out what you think actually happened yeah. because the different sources lie. Um, and none of that aspect is actually in the show. Like they get very definitively with with one exception, the air for a day. But very definitively, they tell us what happens at each moment. Like, yeah. yes, this, these characters had sex. Yes, this person was murdered by this person. Yeah. While, you know, like, uh, for, for example, um, the Strongs die in a fire at Harrenhal. Yeah. Okay. Maybe that was an accident. Maybe not. Maybe it was yeah. Laris. Maybe it was Corlys. Maybe it was Damon. You get a lot of different options in the book about what could have happened. But in the show, it's very definitively Laris. Like Laris definitely does it, you know, or in the books, it's 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 a mystery who the the parents um, or the who the father of Jace, Luke and Joffrey are, you know, could it be could it be at least for in case of Jace? Could it be Kristen Cole? Could it be Lanor? Could it be Harwin? Could it be somebody else? Mm. Um, And and it's a big mystery. No, here on the show, it's pretty. I mean, I, there's some a tiny little mis- bit of a mystery that it's still p- maybe Kristen Cole for Jace, but the, the younger two kids are definitely Harwin Strong's. So like, there's no yeah. ambiguity, um, and so it's like, yeah, you're 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 following the, the material, but the material was ambiguous. So, gotcha. in a sense, thematically, you're thematically you're going from a completely different perspective. Have you, if you were thematically sticking with the source material, all of these things would be ambiguous, but they're not. Um, so it, it's this contradiction, like, yes, it's following the source material, but it's not, but at the same time, we don't really care about them following the source material because <laughs> yeah. no one really, no one really likes the source material that much. Mm. I know there's some people that, that in the comments will be like, oh, I love fire and blood, but honestly speaking, like, are you going to put fire and blood on a must read? Like, is it going to be your top 10 books <laughs> of all time? Like, you know, like, no, that's fair. And, and no. it's, and it's funny because it's like, there are similarities here between these shows in, in a sense, because it's like. I love the I love the unfinished tales and I love the Silmarillion, uh, but I must admit that they are written very differently than the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit. Like I love the tales and the themes that we get, the feeling that I have when I'm reading these things. But the unfinished tales are that they're unfinished, right? So you have these second age stories, and then all of a sudden it just like ends at a sentence, and you're like, okay, well, mm. you know, Tolkien didn't finish that, so on to the next thing. Uh, and you have yeah. you have the Akalabeth, right? The downfall of Numenor in the Silmarillion, and and uh, all of these things, but it's like, it's, you know, notes that Christopher Tolkien put together. He, you know, he summarized it in, in the best, most canonical way he could, but still that source material is so important to, to the fans, right? It's, that's maybe the difference with if fire and blood is like, yeah, it's, it's whatever. It's like, this is still seen as like almost, you know, holy to us as Tolkien fans. It's like, you know, Tolkien loved yeah. these stories and he had such, immense respect and, and ideas for the first age and the second age and the years of the lamps and the trees and all of this uh, to where even if it's not a, co- a super coherent narrative all the time and there are a lot of notes, the notes are still better than a lot of like the coherent narratives that we got in Rings of Power. Right. Like, like you can sit there and say like Galadriel should be acting this way based on this. Yeah. 
There is no character in Fire and Blood where you can say, well, this character should be acting like this. Interesting. Because none of none of their none of their personalities have been fleshed out in any degree. Like and you know Or desires or fetishes. Yeah. If you know what I mean. Yeah. The, yeah. Or their desires or fetishes or motivation. In fact, I'm gonna do a video soon about called called Damon the Hero, where, you know, the way George wrote it, Damon Targaryen could be the hero, a pure character who never does really anything wrong, um, or much wrong. And but and that the history has just made him into an evil guy, and then the show following like a certain reading has made Damon pretty evil. Yeah. But you could read Fire and Blood and you know there there might be one moment where he like goads um the 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 Sea Lord of Bravos' son into a into a duel and then kills him into kills him in the duel just so he can like marry Lena. But that might be the most evil thing that he like positively did, you know? Like Yeah, yeah. Um but but even that, like, well, you know, he didn't murder anybody. He just goaded <laughs> him into a duel. You know? <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> uh, that's a lot different than like showing up in the veil and smashing your wife's head in. Yeah, like, you yeah, know? being a psychopath and choking your wife. You know, who just choking had a miscarriage. your wife? Right. Yeah, right. Yeah, because because she didn't tell you about a prophecy that yeah. again, prophecy not in the book. You know, true. No, no pro. What, yeah, what do you so, guys yeah, think that, about that? What do you guys think about how often they include this prophecy, this uh, Song of Ice and Fire, this reference to Season 8 of Game of Thrones? How, how do you like that? I think it's okay. I mean, you're adding some... You're, they're trying to add stakes yeah. to, to, to a, a fairly dry succession dispute that doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things because That's we... True. we it's, you know, we know what's going to happen. Um, so I'm fine with them adding something mysterious um, and relating to the future. Maybe it'll probably relate to snow in the end. You know, yeah. Whatever, <laughs> return of the White Walkers. That That's what do. I'm thinking is like maybe they haven't done the prophecy yet and they're going to just do that. Retcon, like do a soft retcon of it and in Jon Snow's mm. show. I in order for yeah, Snow to be like successful, that. they have to bring in like the best writers on this planet not yeah. to fuck this up. Totally. <laughs> um but but I agree with, with with Preston like it's it's whatever. What surprised me the most is that this is George's stuff. Um I was wondering if George gave the okay to do this and if George really had like some stuff like this in mind for his books. So we'll just have to see when whenever Winds of Winter comes yeah. out. <laughs> yeah. So it's like some some change like I say some changes are really good. Like I say like making Allison and Rhaenyra friends, fantastic yeah. decision. Um uh, I think I think in the like you know I think making the Valarians black actually worked you know like I yeah. think um like like little things like that I think the prophecy thing eh, you know kind of neutral I think Damon being so evil doesn't work I don't like Damon being so evil um I I you know I I think the Lenor swap out didn't work you know there there's yeah. They're they're hit or miss with their changes, but at the same time, like I don't care. Like the source material is like whatever. The source material is the source material. It's but the good change, I, don't love. I would argue, I, I like that they kind of confirm that Harwin Strong is their father because I don't know Harwin as a character, even though he was in there for for just a couple of episodes, kind of grew on me, and I really wanted to see like the foundation of that relationship because you one episode, oh, yeah. One episode, you have him, like, carry over on, on, on his shoulder, like, carry her out of that situation. And the next episode, they're, like, really into each other. I yeah. really wanted to see more of that. Uh, you know, I said, I don't know if you know this, but George put out a blog post where originally this was supposed to be 12 to 13 episodes. But the only reason yeah. they relented and did 10 was because they were worried that, that it would be too slow. Kind of like how Rings of Power was a little mm. slow. They were yeah. worried that it was, like, all the setup would have been too slow and bore the audience. And it kind of did. It kind of alienated some people when they did the time skip. I always mention how, um, and I'm sure, because you you, you, meant, you brought it up yeah. uh, before we started recording, yeah. fucking Joe Rogan and his friend stopped watching the show after they did the fucking time skip. Because, yeah. like, they just, yeah. like, okay. But some people, some casual fans are just that disconnected, I guess, and that lazy instead of just sticking it out. Um I would have liked to have seen. But it's funny. It's funny that they're. Too. It's funny that it's like in so many ways inverted shows. Like this was supposed yeah. to be a battle of the fantasy shows, and it's like they're so inverted. Like a be- beloved source material, <laughs> where cha- you know 
where changes are seen as a very negative thing, not beloved source material where changes can be can be appreciated and liked. Um, <laughs> you know, a show a, one show is like very thematically cohesive over an entire season, while the other show is like not thematically cohesive but has very good individual episodes. Well, I would never I would never take any of the Rings of Power episode and be like. I really liked episode five. Like, I yeah. can't even remember what they did in fucking episode <laughs> yeah, five. Yeah, exactly. Right? Exactly. They all just kind of fucking blend together. Like, <laughs> um, you know, like so much sex and violence in one show and, and, and not so much in the other. Like, they're very, very fundamentally different shows. And they, they kind of have like, you know, one show is moving way too fast and one show is, mo- show is moving way too slow. Yeah. Um, and all these kind of weird things, like, they're so fundamentally different. They are, oh. but but it's strange because so so connected to it in, in a degree of they're both prequels. They're both coming from source material that's not like the narratives that the that the main stories are right. That the Lord of the Rings is, that Game of Thrones is, or Song of Ice and Fire. And mm. it's just it's just strange because you do have these similarities. And I'll be honest, I mean, I thought well with season eight, with season seven, that's been a couple years. I thought House of the Dragon before I had seen either show i was like i don't think house of the dragon can probably stand up too well against rings of power in terms i think views will tank for house of the dragon in favor of rings of power but my goodness what was i wrong i like for uh, for a long time now i've been singing the praises of house of the dragon when reviewing um when reviewing rings of power because i think it is a far superior show to rings of power just with the amount of care and everything that went into it for sure and yeah, it's, it's just cer- it's, it's certainly better. It's certainly better acted and paced, and yeah. that's that's what's really important. Is when something has, you know, like when 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 an actor can carry an entire scene or an entire like I think there are cer- certain characters that are very poorly written, but they have such a great actor yeah. in the role that you forget about it. And I would say like Rainis is is the example of this. That like Rainis is a horribly written character, mm, yeah, um, who has who has a different motivation every episode and just says random fucking lines that don't make any sense. She's, she says that the high Septon was fucking in, in the last episode crowning <laughs> Aegon, like really ridiculous stuff, like changes her motivation every moment. Um, but you know, the actress is so good that you forget about it. You know, yeah. um, there's, there's, there's just a lot of moments in, in um, house of the dragon where, Act the actor is able to take it to the next level, and I think people think about Patty Constantine and yeah. and um, Matt Smith, the the Vayman, the Va- yeah Matt Smith and the Vaymond actor. Like everyone still likes Damon, and I said like, you know, people don't really like Damon; they like Matt Smith because yeah. Matt Smith's so good. You know, yeah. like, no one should like Damon. Damon's <laughs> horrible. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah, but they like Matt Smith. Um, so I I think that. Rings of Power, of course, hired a whole bunch of nobodies where Uncle Benjen is the is the best actor in the whole show. And he's great. I think Uncle mm-hmm. Benjen does a great job. But everybody else is just, you know, OK. Yeah. You know, no one's yeah. bad, but everybody's they're, they're okay. OK. Yeah. But I would there was never there's never a moment where I'm like where I like finish a scene. And I'm like, oh, my God, the person should get an Emmy. Like, no, yeah, it didn't no. happen. <laughs> like you know, Elendil, the the actor who played Elendil, he um you know he was interviewed by my friend yeah, Matt from Nerd of the Rings, and uh you can tell that he ca- has this care for the source material, and I I, I really do like uh so far his his take on Elendil, but when you're surrounded in mediocre acting and, and mediocre writing and stuff like that, it's just it yeah you kind of aren't memorable even within that, but a whole scene yeah. of just an old man crawling to his throne and, you know, and then his crown falls off his head and then his brother picks it up and places it on his head. It's like, dang, right. That hits you. Yeah. And, and there was just something so magnetic about just episode eight. Uh, that one was my favorite personally. It just, oh, yeah. it might as well. Yeah. That one just stuck with me for sure. Um, yeah. And I, yeah, I didn't get that feeling from, from Rings of Power for sure. I, I would have loved to like, <laughs> I'd have loved 12 or 13 episodes of, of House of the Dragon, but I'm also, you know, like I've studied politics and stuff. So that stuff, I love it. Right. But yeah, the, um, the, so like the direction of how, like House of the Dragon exceeded my expectations quite a bit. Um, the direction 
was another world above the direction of of Game of Thrones. Yeah. Um, uh, the acting was better than Game of Thrones. Um, the writing, I think, like dialogue, I think, is better than Game of Thrones. Weirdly, though... You think it's better than Game of Thrones the later seasons, right? Well, sir, I think it's certainly better than Game of Thrones the later seasons. Like, um, But mm. what's very odd is when, when you sit back and say, okay, this is House of the Dragon is a show that has superior direction, superior acting, um, superior dialogue. Well, then, then like, even Game of Thrones seasons one to three. Yet Game of Thrones seasons one to three are clearly better than House of the Dragon. Right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, like what, what is it about like the whole package of Game of Thrones seasons yeah. one to three that made it so good? I think um, it's, I think it's just like the, the, the scale of the world, the size of the plot, the size of these characters that you felt that maybe, maybe this is the season where Danny comes over from Essos, or maybe this is mm. the time when the white walkers do something crazy. Like anything in the whole world could go crazy. But right now it's like, okay, either somebody in house in team green does something crazy or somebody in team black does something crazy, but it all be around King's landing or at least thematically central to King's landing. I think it's the scope of the world, you know? You're right. I think like the I think what I really loved about watching those first seasons that is that the minute you get sick of like, you know, Catalan talking to Rob, you're yeah. all of a sudden in Esos. And if you get sick of Esos, all of a sudden you're at the wall. And the I think the diverse environments and the diverse yeah. interwoven stories um had such a a, a magical um pull for me yeah um that 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 it all kind of came together and you know the the dialogues the dialogues most a lot of the dialogue actually is from the book in the first three seasons they'll like take lines directly from so a oh, lot of it is has george's poetry in it but um uh which they just didn't have for the later seasons but, yeah um yeah so uh, i mean it's a funny thing it's a funny very funny thing that i could like you can pinpoint and say well everything that they're doing in house of the dragon individually might be better but for some reason the the yeah. sum is not as is not the 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 as as strong as the the whole of the parts or whatever you know yeah that, that, well and that's like another comparison that you could even draw too with like rings of power and the hobbit films because the hobbit films are mm. full of problems and full of maybe some oh yeah you know random like inconsistencies or whatever it is but in some ways, and maybe it's just because of the directors and the writers and all of that kind of stuff, in some ways that still feels more Middle Earthian to me, still feels more Tolkienian to me than Rings of Power does. Mm. Which is strange. Yeah, I would say there's yeah. you know, I, I saw I saw like somebody put out a report card for for Rings of Power and they listed like eight different things and then they give an overall grade and it's like, well, how do you choose those categories? Like how, yeah. how are you choosing say like cinematography to be equal to like writing, you know, like, sure, uh, sure. You know, like, like uh, which, which is more important? Do I weigh those two things the same amount? Um, and everybody and every person is going to be approaching something differently. Like, you know, if you're if you're a movie snob, you think a lot more about sound edit sound editing than than the average person who doesn't think about sound editing at all. Yeah, totally. You know? So <laughs> totally. You know. Yeah. Um so yeah, the 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 uh it's so yeah, the uh gosh, now now I'm just like I'm almost at a loss of, of words for like what it was about these different shows that like makes me think one is better than the other yeah. or, or, or whatever. I'm about to binge house of the dragon and I'm a little um, for a video I'm going to do. And I'm a little um, fearful that in a binging format, mm. it's going to fall apart because I think, I think there's, a pacing issue. People say pacing or, or like themes or whether something is totally consistent, I think is a very important thing to people. Like, you know, when somebody goes to a movie and they say, and you know, it's just some shitty romantic comedy, but they come back and they go, ah, oh, you know, I liked it. it, it you know, yeah, it, it, it was, it was what it was. And I, I think that phrase like, Oh, you know, the movie didn't, some people say the reverse, the movie didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. I think it has to do with like tonal inconsistency. And I think there might be some tonal inconsistency with House of the Dragon that um, is is dragging it down yeah. versus, say, Game of Thrones, which didn't have any tonal inconsistency, you know? 
That's true. Yeah, um, I've I've been rewatching some of Game of Thrones. My girlfriend's going through it for the first time now. And so we're rewatching, uh, you know, I, she's just going for it. So I'm catching her at certain episodes and I'm like, "Yeah, man, this was this was something else. This was intriguing and even though I know what's going to happen to this character, right? Or I kind of remember th- what's going to happen with this character. It's like this yeah, it felt put together. It felt interesting in a way that it it is hard to pinpoint, like the subtle moments. And I feel like that's the big thing is obviously, you know, House of the Dragon, like it does have bigger moments and, and, and flashier moments from time to time with the dragons, especially. But it it is subtlety, whereas Rings of Power is um, it's all about the flash and it's all about the um, just the idea that it's a Lord of the Rings show, I feel like. Uh, but yeah. the subtlety but is I feel far like more people... interesting. I think people started liking Rings of Power. What's funny about Rings of Power is I would say the first episode of Rings of Power is the most exciting, but everybody hates the first episode because it seems to be <laughs> choppy. Yeah. And then every right? And yeah. because I and then people kind of get into the groove later on and I think that might have to do with pacing and total 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 consistency. Like the show becomes totally consistent later later but in the beginning you're like what the fuck am i watching yeah it's all over the place (laughs) i told preston they Um, probably should have released like the first three episodes together for it to like really have set in because the first three episodes i didn't mind watching them together back to back first three episodes are 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 fairly okay and then it just starts there's where there's way too much setup there's way too much setup for not not, enough payoff for sure not enough payoff that was the issue by the way you mentioned the dragons um i'm going back and forth because I'm also going to rewatch the uh, the show again, uh, House of the Dragon and binge it. We complained about for a show called House of the Dragon, there weren't a lot of dragons. But at the same time, I don't want them to use the dragons unnecessarily. We we probably, we what were we saying, Preston, uh, for the episode 10 podcast, we were saying how probably the budget. But I'm, I'm kind of glad that they were used sparingly because that way when Me they too. are used... Then it's, by, a, by, it's a real by big the way, you just you just remind you just reminded me that Damon went to war for for a couple episodes, and I was like, <laughs> oh right, that was another shock episode, and his war yeah. was kind of shitty. Yeah. Like we just kind of <laughs> forgot about it, right? Like the most exciting part with all these dragons and death, we like put out of our mind. Yeah, because it, it had like nothing to do. You know, nobody cares about the stepstones. Not even like Viserys cared about the stepstones. You know, so. <laughs> I, but I'll never, I'll like never forget what you said, Preston, years ago about how the dragons are just nukes. That's just what they are thematically. Yeah. And and if this is a novel that could be about climate change or a novel series that could be in some ways about climate change and the woes of humanity in the world, if these are nukes, I mean, it, it is good that they're used sparingly because it's like you've got two powerful entities in the Civil War who have like an armament of nukes pointed at each other. It it makes it really interesting, but I'm also glad, Carmine, that they're used sparingly for sure. Well, yeah, because you don't want to yeah. get the audience too used to seeing this. You have to use them in a very like intelligent way, I guess, right. because like in episode 10, when, when Caraxes comes out and is right next to Damon, that looked a little, that looked, looked a little fake. To me personally, so yeah, eh. yeah, yeah that was sure. a, yeah, that was the one. But yeah, they always they're always finding a way to Professor X them. Like the the joke in X Men comics is that Professor X is such a powerful mutant that he could like solve every issue by himself. So <laughs> yeah. they always had to find they always had to find a way to like get rid of Professor X. Like oh, he's off world with the with the with the Star Jammers like traveling the galaxy. Oh, he's in a coma. Like they always had to like Professor X the character. Yeah. So that the X-Men had, you know, could could fight. And, and then the show <laughs> struggles with even doing that to some degree because of that scene in uh episode 9 where Rainey's has her dragon and it's just like you could end it right there and you don't have a right. you don't have too much reason to do so but you also don't have too much reason not to and then not it's so. it's like the internal logic cuz rings of power does it too everybody's saying oh nobody cared about the volcano going off when Sam and Frodo were there well it's cuz they didn't show a bunch of ash and smoke so i kind of forgot about that but rings of power it was just all ash and smoke so i was like how did they survive that <laughs> If you're gonna show, yeah. if you're gonna yeah. show the scene, you gotta have the internal logic. If Rainey's is right there, she has to have a reason not to just nuke all of her potential enemies, right? If there's gonna yeah. be smoke and ash and dust from Mount Doom, you have to have an explanation why Galadriel survives it or, or random humans survive with, with, it. With, uh, with House of the Dragon, they really go with the the method of let's just forget the dragons don't exist until they do. Yeah, you know, like oh, like you know who you should marry, Lenor Valarian. 
oh, really, fucking Lenor Valarian, the one other fucking person who has a dragon. Really? <laughs> yeah. You really think, like, like, like no one, like, you know, instead it's like, oh, he, he would have Valyrian blood. And he's got a fucking dragon. Of course you want to fucking marry the dragon fucking riders. This wouldn't be a fucking, like, genius idea, Hand. You're like, just... Uh, like, like, in, in terms of what you were saying, Yoisten, about, like, you know, the whole Rainies thing and, and what happened with that scene and the volcano thing and Rings of Power, someone yeah. said this in my comment section and I have to echo it here. It's the rule of cool. When you when when you make something mm. look really cool and something happens that's supposed to be, like, fucking, oh, that's so awesome, it kind of – logic has to kind of go out the window sometimes because yeah. – Right, the, the trailer scene. Yeah, like, yeah. We, we wanted to show Galadriel with – we wanted to show Galadriel showed like covered in soot and looking really cool for the trailer. Um, it was the same like Ra- like Rainy saying to Alicent, "Have you ever imagined yourself on the Iron Throne?" That line makes no fucking sense yeah. in the dialogue at all. But it's like we need this line to be the end of the trailer. Have you ever imagined yourself <laughs> on the Iron Throne? Or the Balrog like, showing up randomly yeah, in the fucking yeah. like oh, you got to have the yeah. Balrog for the for the trailers because everybody remembers the Balrog. Uh, but it's like, True. yeah, it's it sucks that they succumb to the to the easy desire of, the, uh, yeah, like the the cool rule, right? It's like it's just it's right there. You don't have to take it though. You don't always. You could savor the moment. You can have maybe a hint, mm-hmm. right? Have have a tremor that's like, ooh, what was that? And it's like. Maybe, you know, the the stones are heating up and it's like, oh, that's weird. And we as the audience are like, that's got to be the freaking Balrog right there. That's what that's got to be. But we're not sure, right? We're not sure. It, it teases us with that. And then we don't know. We don't have any other explanation until later seasons. But now it's guys, like they have to use it. <laughs> do you guys do you guys remember how Terminator 2 is, is, is set up as a movie? Like, do you know that like Ter- Terminator 2 actually spends a long time like pretending that Arnold Schwarzenegger is the villain. And then there's a reveal. There's a reveal at like the quarter point or third point of the movie where you're thinking that Arnold Schwarzenegger is going to kill John Connor. And then he flips around and turns and and ends up like defending him. And there's this big switch in the movie. And the thing is, I remember when that movie came out and in the advertising of the movie, they advertised Arnold Schwarzenegger as the hero. And they ruined, like, I don't know if there was a single oh, yeah. person on the planet who who watched Terminator 2 and was fooled by that reveal. Like, I hope there was, like, one or two people out there who never saw a trailer, who, like, had that experience. But for all the other hundreds of millions of people that have seen Terminator 2, they all were denied that wonderful twist, you know? Yeah. Um, and it, it's so odd because it's like very hard to divorce art from the media campaigns used to promote the art in the first place, you know? And so it's, mm-hmm. it's, uh, yeah, and here, like changing the plot for the media campaign, you know, like, yeah. you know, adding scenes for the media campaign, um, just changes everything. It's like, how, how are we even supposed to view Rings of Power with all of these, like, people claiming, like, bitching about its wokeness and stuff and and the same with same with house of the dragon like how you know like it, it's so mm. difficult now to even like enjoy the stuff in a vacuum it, it is uh. and, and the backlash to i'm curious about the backlash you guys have gotten for your takes on house of the dragon because for me it's like at first and even still kind of now some people see me as having been way too kind to rings of power but for the most hmm. part, the criticism that I get is that I was just a hater, that I'm just a rage tuber now, that like I'm a I'm a diet other rage tubers that I that I won't mention, but like that I'm like them. And I'm like, not <laughs> really. I have all these reasons to say the things that I'm saying. I don't know. Uh, and then it's weird because then some people are like, you're a true Tolkien fan. You're not a shill like these other channels or whatever. And I'm like, I. I don't care, right? I'm just enjoying it or not enjoying it as I see fit and just sharing my thoughts and these other YouTubers, yeah. whether they engage with rage-filled content or not, or if they do like the show, they're all my friends, so I got nothing to say about that, right? It's just do you, weird. Do you, have, do, you have Tolkien, do you have Tolkien, super Tolkien fans who quite like the show? Um... Depends on, I guess, how you would define super Tolkien fan. Like, you have some that 
maybe think it's all right or it's like good. Some of my friends that are other Tolkien YouTubers that think, yeah, it's all right. Or mm. yeah, it's, it's moderately fine. But Which no one? one Nerd of the Rings? Does he like it? Yeah, he seems to, he seems to generally, at least he's a lot more positive towards it than I am for sure. Mm-hmm. And, and that's totally yeah. fine, right? We're going to have those different uh, opinions on that, but yeah, I, I have not really seen anyone just absolutely sing its praises and just say nothing wrong with it. Like this is the best, ep- yeah. the best show ever. Right. I'd say that the difference with Hot D, um, Hot D gets a lot more bandwagoners than mm-hmm. like, than I would say Rings of Power. Um, I mean, may- maybe Rings of Power gets a lot of bandwagon haters, but like Hot D gets like these people that are like, oh, I was really into George R. George R. Martin the whole time. And I'm going to, you know, let's do, let's do a, an Easter eggs video. And it's like, you, you, you don't know, you, you know, like, yeah. like Carmen and I know who all of the, <laughs> the, 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 the ice and fire, like experts are out there, you know, like, yeah. and, and we know which, which people like know the story, like inside and out, like, you know, totally. even the people we, even, even the people we hate or the people we like, like, you know, we know they, they know the story. Like we know that they really, really know the material. Yeah. And so then when all, when so, all of a sudden, like somebody from out of nowhere is like making videos, um, you know, you know, saying, saying various stuff or like, where does this come from? So you get these bandwagoners and they have bandwagon opinions as well. And so <laughs> interesting. Um, yeah. And so there was definitely like a narrative before the show w- uh, aired that it was going to be this horrible woke fest. And then when it did air and it, it is a woke fest, don't don't get me wrong. House of the Dragon is very political, very mm-hmm. liberal political. Um, but because it's good, all of a sudden, like people will shut up about it. People yeah. will shut up about that aspect of it. Well, well, they were bitching about like House Valarion being black. Me and Preston were very open and upfront about it. Did we care that they were black? No. But we weren't going to like make mental gymnastics as to how they could be black. Yeah. It was very clear from the off, off, onset that Ryan Condal made them black for diversity's sake. Once again, did we care about that? No. Who cares? As long as the story is good, which right. it was, as long as the show is good, which it was, that's all really that matters. But we're not going to sugarcoat it. Right. I, in fact, in fact, I would say I would say I was even wrong in the sense that I thought it didn't matter. And then episode eight happened and I was like, it did matter. And it made the story better. It did. It, did, yeah. Yeah, it made the story yeah. better. So mm-hmm. I was like, I'll admit I was wrong. Like I thought like there are some changes that just like don't like it doesn't matter. Like you, you can watch like Man of Steel and they changed uh, the, the head of like like Superman's boss. They made into Lawrence Fishburne in Man of Steel. All right. You know, they, they just swapped him. Did they make any change to the story? That, that had no change to the story at all. Didn't make a difference whether whether or not yeah. Superman's boss is black. Who cares? Um, or in uh, James Bond, like they made the CIA agent black. Um, and, and you know, who cares? Or, or making M a woman, like rarely. Ugh, there might have been a few lines here and there, but it didn't really change anything. Um, I thought it was going to be a situation like that, like it wouldn't matter, but it actually did matter uh, for for episode eight, and I and I th- I thought it actually like made the show better. But yeah, yeah, um, no, that's totally fair. But but you'll find that all of these like YouTubers all of a sudden will shut up about that. Like oh the re- you know like the reason they'll say like the reason Rings of Power is bad is for for its wokeness, but House of the Dragon is still good despite its wokeness you know like mm. it's um even though it's fundamental part of the plot the fact that like women are getting passed over yeah for the iron throne you know? that, like, that's interesting so it's actually, like it's actually, a criticism when uh when the show itself is kind of has writing problems or other issues then right. the wokeism becomes a criticism too but it's not a criticism if the show is actually good if the other elements of the show are good I also put some of the blame of that on some of the audience, not all, because they, they fall for the grift. Like, they'll watch these YouTubers who are clearly over-exaggerating something that isn't a problem into a problem and outright, like, outright lying about certain things and oftentimes being hypocrites, and nobody seems to notice it. Like, for example, season one of Mandalorian, you had Gina Carano's character Cara Dune fighting Mando to a standstill, and that upset a lot of these weirdo grifters, and they started calling her the woke queen, but then later, like, she compares being anti-vax to Jews in the Holocaust, and all of a sudden, she isn't the woke queen, but their queen. Like, it, it's very clear that it's a grift, and it's a shame people don't seem to understand that, or they're too dumb to understand it. Like, the number one counter I always get for any of this is, 
bro, it's not a grift. Like, they just don't like it, and I don't like it either. That's fine. Nobody's getting out of your case for not liking something. But there's a difference between not thinking the story is well written versus complaining about a casting choice and how a black elf supposedly ruins the entire show before it's even out. Like, come on, dude. Like, now it's now it's just bad faith. What's so funny about Rings of Power, the fact that, like, certain characters are black has no impact on the plot whatsoever. No impact. Disa appears for, like, ten minutes in the entire series. Yeah. And 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 all, all criticisms of Rings of Power all have her on the thumbnail looking like a man and, like, with tears. Like, okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Like, but the, but it has, it has, it has no, well, while... Like one could argue, well, quite quite well, that the the elements of like sex and gender and 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 race are very fundamental to the House of the Dragon plot. So True. shouldn't House of the Dragon like is fu- is just fundamentally like plot wise the whole story is? I mean, if they're going to be using that term woke, as in like having liberal ideas in there, it's much more that than rings of power which just incidentally has black characters like the black characters have like them being black has no role at all for me it's like i don't you know i i don't speak politics on on my channel at all uh especially Mm. especially being somebody who's like studied political science who teaches government and all that stuff so i can't i'm not gonna really speak to the wokeness or whatever it is but it is interesting just about the politics at large. This is one of the biggest, like, and the show can't really control this, right? I've given Rings of Power a lot of crap about other things. It can't control mm. the culture that consumes it in that regard. And it's too bad that, like, no matter what, if it was Rings of Power or some other Tolkien adaptation, that in today's world it couldn't get away from politics one way or the other. Again, I, you know. Right. Like, if they, yeah. if they, if they cast only white people, they would be like, people would be like, oh, Rings of Power is so white, you know, yeah. or something like that. And, and if they, if they cast some black people, everyone's like, oh, you're pandering. So they're, they're fucking, you know, they're yeah, damned they're if stuck. they do and they're damned they're if stuck. they don't. The irony of it is that Rings yeah. of Power was. Not that woke in comparison to House of the Dragon, which was very quote unquote woke. If you're if you're going by by you know the Grifter's uh, point of view of it, because House of the Dragon has all those things right. he said. George R. R. Martin himself was a I'm with her uh, voting for Hillary guy. And uh, so like, if you're if you're really if you're really looking at it, it's sh- the, the more I guess the more woke elements, the better the show. <laughs> yeah, that's apparently it. <laughs> they just they just did they didn't have enough of it in, in Rings of Power. <laughs> this is. But it's like it's strange yeah. too because like Tolkien was always very uh, you know he's he was always very anti allegory right he wanted his story to be escapist mm. and his time was so just politically and historically different right and and granted like in the post war era post World War II era it was it was all about escapism uh, you know definitely themes and metaphors and symbols perhaps like imagery of heroes versus villains with Star Wars and, and whatever else but. In that era, it was it was good. Everybody wanted to get away from the world. Everyone wanted to escape. But now we live mm-hmm. in this just strange time where we have to see our values reflected in the characters and the stories that we watch, regardless of either side of the political aisle or whatever. Uh, you know, again, as me as a YouTuber, I'm just apolitical. I don't care about any of it as as I am as a YouTuber. But I, yeah, it's too bad to see that even in the Lord of the Rings show, um, where people are comparing our Farazan speeches to those of a certain politician, right? Or <laughs> make Numenor great again, or what baby. have you. <laughs> so it's just, it's just, yeah, it's too bad that this is the environment through which rings of power had to, had to come to light and, and even make adjustments of its own, because maybe that was intentional. Maybe they were trying to make our Farazan seem like that or whatever it was, but it just shouldn't be like that. If rings of power is going a political way in one, one direction or another, I am totally against that, just in that it's political, because Tolkien was trying to go as escapist as possible. Mm. Obviously, everything has some views and some ideas, and you know everyone has their uh, has their bias when they create art. But it's too bad that it's becoming so infected, even yeah. in you know Lord of the Rings. So now, Yoiston, both shows, House of the Dragon and Rings of Power, mm-hmm. are um, objectively sma- both smash hits. Okay, they both have incredible mm-hmm. ratings. Um, everyone's been talking about both shows. They have a lot of buzz, articles everywhere. Like, um, you know, what 
whether whether people like like the shows or not, it doesn't really matter because objectively speaking, there people are watching and talking about the show, yeah. and that means the the show that means there's going to be more. There's yeah. going to be more. Um, have you heard any rumblings about like cinematic universe? Uh, oh. Like like they like they're doing with House of the Dragon. <laughs> like we're we're getting fucking Corlys, Corlys, you know, ten thousand yeah. ships, Jon Snow, E. T. Like, are they going to do like, you know, the two blue pre- the two blue wizards in the east, that kind of shit? <laughs> like, is are we gonna are we gonna have a show about that? You know, it's it's have you heard any rumblings. Like, obviously, you know, we had that article that you guys talked about with Netflix and HBO and their pitches that they made instead of you know Amazon and all of that. And how Netflix was trying to go after that cinematic universe route with Lord of the Rings. I, it's, it's actually funny. I'm not entirely against the idea of multiple um, anthology stories being shown to us like year to year. I mean, next year we have War of the Rohirrim, which is an anime set in Rohan with their uh, wars with the Dunlendings and the Easterlings and so forth. And it's like, that sounds freaking cool. That's a very, uh, it's very much an anthology sort of story. And I think there is a place for that where where you do have a show which is the downfall of Moria and you do have a show which is the Angmar War or the Gondorian Civil War or things like that where you're just going through the appendices and you're telling these stories, even like a couple, like a, a mini series of the story of Aragorn and Arwen and their, their love story and things like that. I'm actually very much, I think that if it was done properly would be so good, but that's the problem is cinematic universes aren't really done super well <laughs> because there's so much more money to be made. If you just keep pumping out the content, regardless of the quality as we're starting to see with the MCU. And as we've seen with the DC universe and all of that. And so I don't know if Amazon actually, if they're talking about it, if they have the ability to do something like that, um, because you know, they would actually have to look at the, look at the source material in the appendices and use that versus coming up with their own. I guess they could, but I think if they just continuously came up with their own lore, eventually it will die because people will say, this isn't Lord of the Rings. This is again, just more fan fiction. Yeah. Um, once- what's, what's really sad is um, with, with uh, Carmine, and I've, uh, Carmine and, I, and I have been watching Andor, Andor's yeah. ratings are, are abysmal. Yep. And it is by far the greatest Star Wars tale that's been written, that's been created in 40 years. It is Dang. so fucking good. It's so fucking good. And no one's watching. But do you know no why it's so good? And you're just like, oh. There's almost no yeah. Star Wars elements in it. Like, did you watch the latest episode, There's Preston? no Star Wars element. I did. I did. And I got to the end and I'm like, ah! It was like, it's, like the, it's like the wire where they just end the episode at a random point And you're like, ah, oh, why are you just, why are you ending it there? Dang. I want to see more. There's like no, there's, a, a, yeah. there's almost no like aliens or like je- uh, talk of Jedi it's, or the it, Force. It's, it's it's a slow burn. There are yeah. moments that are exciting, but it's a slow burn, kind of like The Wire. Like I've not like it's such it's such a fucking good show. Interesting and cool. It, oh my god! And no one's watching. It's got horrible yeah. ratings. Yeah, no, I'm I'm not watching. Uh, I I will if it continues to be to be good. Then I'll probably just binge it. But um, one thing I am curious about is how if and how Rings of Power is able to make back a billion dollars off of two seasons of television. Because that's like, even if oh, it was I a mean, smash, smash hit, it's like, that would take so long to make that money back. I feel like for two seasons of a show, especially if they are making changes to address the the middle of the road reviews that they got with season one, which I've heard some mutterings about that, that they might be changing. A but ra- ratings wise, ratings wise, it is a smash hit. Like it's mm. exceeded their, their viewership by far. Yeah. Um, so I'm, but I, you know, I don't know what their function is. Are they just trying to pull people into the channel and then hoping they they, they watch other things, you know, or or, but or or what, you know? What's interesting is you only need an Amazon Prime like membership to watch the show. But even before the show came out, did you know anyone without Amazon Prime? Like that was something that my yeah. friend Royan said. It's like that's interesting. Everybody already had Amazon Prime, but what did this right. really do? Why, why, yeah. <laughs> It's not like you had to pay extra for it, so I don't see how they make that money back in a in a big way. I, I'm just I, I don't like they could, I, and maybe I just don't understand it. But two seasons, a billion dollars. It's like they way overspent because even if the show was the was the next Game of Thrones, it's like it'll take a while to earn that kind of money. Like uh, Avengers, Endgame right? I mean, kind of you're money. right that I don't I don't understand why Amazon Prime exists. Like you're giving me something for free on top of something I already was going to buy. Are you planning on one day breaking them off and like having people pay for the, the TV service 
Separately. you know, independent of the of the Whole Foods. Yeah, you know? like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, right, like, um, like what? Yeah, it's 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 something. It's something. It's something crazy that's added on to something that I, that I would have never expected, right? Like, oh, I already have access to this. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, versus like HBO. So. You know, I'm sure a lot of people went back to HBO after they heard House of the Dragon was good, and that maybe haven't had it since Game of Thrones ended. But it's like yeah. Amazon Prime. You already had it's, that because you wanted that two day shipping. That's true. <laughs> I, that's why I have it. <laughs> right. It's 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 not like yeah. It's not like you know. Oh yeah, I've got Verizon for for my internet. Oh, I get free HBO. Like you know, it's not one of those situations. Yeah. Like yeah. it's one of those regular things in life that you already do that you're already spending money on. Exactly. So yeah. I don't. You're not spending any extra money on it. It's not like merchandising has probably been that huge. I mean, what would they what would they make toys of or what would they make replicas of it's not there's not a ton they, they you know they've got a couple things but that's not going to earn back yeah. a billion dollars that's more that's more like a marvel lucasfilm like yeah. um kind of situation where they where half their money is from toys and they and they always keep that in mind i mean uh, actually yoiston uh i'm i'm before we wrap this up because yeah. we've gone on for like almost two hours now <laughs> um i have to ask you because you're actually quite interesting in the sense where you're the only person I've spoken to out of hundreds of people who were who were gonna watch House of the Dragon. You're the only person I spoke to who held off mm-hmm. until you heard good things about it. Yeah. Because, and I, and I bring this back to Rings of Power. Even though Rings of Power season one was just not that great, I'm still gonna tune in for season two, and I'm assuming mm-hmm. you are as well. Yeah, so if, uh, I've said this before, it's like, if I wasn't a Lord of the Rings YouTuber, I would have stopped watching Rings of Power personally. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I don't... I feel like as much. Yeah, I... No, whatever. <laughs> like, it's... It was kind of... I mean, right, my dad was the one who got me into into Lord of the Rings. And uh, he's read, you know, Christopher Tolkien's autobiography and Tolkien's biography and all this kind of stuff. Or maybe not autobiography, but just, like, the biography of him and how he put together his father's works for all his life, Christopher Tolkien, and all this stuff... And to see, to have those conversations with my dad, the one who got me started in Middle Earth in the first place, and to just see his utter disappointment in the show, I feel the same way. I'm just like, yeah, like he stopped watching it part way through. I'm like, if I wasn't a Lord of the Rings mm. YouTuber, I would have too, because I just, I'm busy and this, this isn't the best thing on, the best thing to watch right now. So, right, um, it's a, li- it's a little boring. Like if it didn't yeah. have the IP and it, if it didn't have everybody else talking about it, like, and you know. Like, yeah. I, I want to be able to say to people, well, I watch the show and this is my opinions about it, you know, because I want to be part of those conversations. Sure. I, and that's where it's like, I would be a part of those conversations with House of the Dragon because that's something I actually wanted to watch. But Rings of Power, after a certain point, I was like, meh. And and I've heard those arguments, too, of like, well, if you're just going to watch it and not like it, why put yourself through that? Why continue to watch? But And I really grappled with that for, for a little bit and was like, well, if I don't like it and I know it's probably not going to get better... Uh, you know, I can have that hope that it will, but why would I keep watching? And I really came to the conclusion that as a Tolkien YouTuber, it, you know, it calls itself Lord of the Rings. It calls itself, if it wasn't, if it, if it was its Amazon's, you know, fan fiction, fair enough, then that's what it is. And I don't have to watch it. It calls itself Lord of the Rings. And I call myself a Lord of the Rings YouTuber. And it, the show is not good enough to be in an echo chamber of praise because of everybody who did not like a show just stopped watching it, stopped criticizing it, then it would get 100% of Rotten Tomatoes, and it would get all positive reviews. And no, I'm, like, too offended by what the show has done. And there are good <laughs> moments in the show, but I'm too offended from what the show has done. No, it doesn't deserve the positive echo chamber. I'm going to keep watching as long as I have my platform, and, like, as long as I, you know, ha- have the fortune to keep doing what I'm doing, I'm going to keep watching it, keep giving my thoughts, good and bad, because that's it, it calls itself Lord of the Rings, and that's why. And on, so, on that yeah. note, uh, do you guys mind if we wrap it up here? Let's do it. Sounds good. Uh, guys, thank you so much for joining us. As always, we'll see you all next time. Have a good one.